Testing one, two. Testing one, two. One, two, one, two. Testing one, two. The TV or Testing one, two, testing one, two. Testing one, two, testing one, two. There's a delay.
Testing one, two. Testing one, two. Welcome everyone. I call to the order the January th January 31st, 2022, adjourned regular meeting of the City Council. Will everyone please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance. Madam City Clerk, can we get a roll call, please? Councilmember Massey? Here. Councilmember Campbell? Here. Councilmember Amato? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Jackson? Here. Mayor DeToy? Here. You have a quorum, sir. I'll look to my colleagues for any announcements. C. 
Seeing none, I have a short one. Just to thank everyone who came out to the first uh, event this past Saturday for the mayor's conversation and cleanup at Seaview Parquet. School board member Maggie Bove Lamonica, city staff, and I were able to answer some questions for the community. And we also picked up the trash at the parquet and surrounding areas. The next cleanup and conversation event will be Saturday, February 26th at 9 a.m. Stay tuned for more details on that event as the date gets closer. Next item is approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve? Any modifications? Councilman Armato? So moved. Councilmember Massey with a second. second. <laughs> Any uh, comments? Madam City Clerk? Councilmember Massey? Aye. Councilmember Campbell? Aye. Councilmember Armato? Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Jackson? Aye. Mayor DeToy? Aye. Motion carries 5 0. The next item is public participation. And although the city council values your comment, the Brown Act generally prohibits the council from taking action on any matter not listed on the posted agenda as a business item. This is a time for you to speak on matters on the agenda or matters off of the agenda that have jurisdiction within the city of Hermosa Beach. I'd like to remind those at the Zoom and in the audience that if you speak at the public participation part on any of the items, then you will not be able to speak at the time of the item. And each comment is uh, limited to three minutes per speaker. If you'd like to uh, speak, please raise your virtual hand or star six to unmute and star nine to raise your hand if you're on the telephone. We have one public speaker in the audience, that's Tony Higgins. Um, there you go, yeah. Okay, quick clarification. I can speak about non-agenda items now and agenda items when they come up, right? Okay, yeah. Um, so this is a non-agenda item. Um, I wanna speak more about the um, obnoxiously loud modified exhaust vehicles that are um, uh, uh, hitting our neighborhood over and over and over again. Um, the, it, on Thursday through s Sunday night, between 9 and 1 a.m. on 27th Street, it's every five or 10 minutes, one of these vehicles blows up the street. And if you're in a sound sleep, it'll, it'll wake you up two or three times a night. That's... Um, that's not right now. I spoke to Councilman Jackson briefly uh, before the last council meeting, and what he said is the police are doing all they can about it, or words to that effect. Now, I've done public information requests that show they have never issued a ticket on 27th Street for a loud vehicle, even though it's super prone to it because of the, the steep hills and the vehicles are under, uh, you know, full load, and, and they're, they're speeding like crazy. I don't believe they've ever even, in the last year or two, issued a ticket for rolling stops on 27th at Morningside, even though during that time frame that I mentioned, six out of 10 vehicles don't come to, a, seven out of 10 don't come to a full stop and one in five blows through at a greater than five miles an hour. But there's no enforcement. I don't think we have these engineering traffic surveys. We're supposed to be able to use radar on these road segments. I don't think a single radar enforcement ticket has been issued on 27th ever, ever. Um, no speeding enforcement, no failure to yield um, at, at, at the crosswalks, which happens all up and down Hermosa Avenue. Now, I think 
the goal. It's, it, it's a real tough problem. What do you do about these speeding and especially the modified exhaust vehicles? I get that. But I think the goal has to be, if you're gonna come into our city with one of these noisy, obnoxiously loud vehicles, then if you speed, you're gonna get pulled over. And if you unnecessarily accelerate or intimidate people by driving on their rears, you're gonna get pulled over. But that's not happening. It's not happening on 27th, and I spent a lot of time on Hermosa Avenue in North Hermosa. It's not happening there either. We got a real problem. Uh, now, Councilman Jackson, you, you, you said that the police are doing everything they can do. So maybe you can speak briefly to what it is they are doing. And I know you can't engage me in a dialogue, but you can, at the end of participation, provide a brief status. So. I'd, I'd certainly appreciate that. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jonathan Wicks, and I would like to re remind you that I'm going to throw the three-minute timer up at 30 seconds for you to wrap up your comments. Hold on, please. Welcome, Jonathan. I don't know what happened to Jonathan, um, so we'll go to the title, Soars and Associates. Let me unmute you. Go ahead, please. I actually don't have a comment at this time. I just noted that um, in the um, reference you made that there was only one participant, and I just wanted to let you know I'm on Zoom. I have no other comments. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in chambers would like to speak at this first public participation chance? You'll have another one after the study session, another one uh, when the agenda item comes up. Seeing no one in chambers, we'll do one last call online. Mouse down to your bottom of the screen, raise your virtual hand if you're on telephone. You can dial star nine to raise your virtual hand. Seeing none, I will close the first public participation opportunity. Madam City Clerk. Okay, the next item is opening remarks by City Manager Suja Lowenthal. Thank you, Madam Clerk, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of the Council. Good evening to you. I'd like to thank you before we get started this evening. And before we begin our staff presentation this evening, I'd like to thank our team for their efforts to prepare all of us for the discussion this evening and for ensuring that our city council, as well as our residents have the information needed to have a thoughtful dialogue regarding our city parking programs. At its September 28, 2021 meeting, city council requested a review of the city's parking programs be placed on a future city council agenda. Parking was originally scheduled as part of the revenue study session, but after the request by the council, it was scheduled for a standalone study session we have this evening. Tonight's parking study session will allow time to review current information and have a full discussion on the multifaceted parking issues without the pressure of moving on to other revenue related topics. Parking management is a team effort involving all city departments. You'll see many staff members present this evening, several of them contributing to the presentation and part of responding to questions and the conversation. Our community is also accustomed to longstanding programs for how the city manages parking, and it can be difficult to discuss possible modifications. Our parking programs have impacts ranging from transportation choices, use of city property, and even economic vitality and private investment decisions. For these reasons, it's important to periodically revisit the programs and have a discussion. In recent years, the city has prepared two very important and forward-thinking planning documents to analyze issues 
and identify goals related to parking management. In 2017, the city adopted Plan Hermosa, which includes a mobility element. A few years later, in 2019, the city completed its coastal zone parking management study as a basis to revise parking standards and make necessary adjustments to residential and employee parking permit and fee programs within the coastal zone. Staff will touch on elements of each of those documents this evening. Goal four of Plan Hermosa's mobility element is to have a parking system that meets the parking needs and demands of residents, visitors, and employees in an efficient and cost-effective manner. In support of our efforts to achieve our parking-specific goals, Plan Hermosa's overarching goals and to fully certify a local coastal program, the city engaged a consultant to prepare the coastal zone parking management study in 2019. The study contains 12 recommendations to move the city forward. This purpose, the purpose of this evening's parking study is to report on the city's progress on the recommendations of the 2019 coastal zone parking management study and which were accepted by the city council and to discuss current challenges and priorities for improving management of the city's parking resources. With that, I'll hand over to our community development director, Ken Robertson, our finance director, Vicki Copeland, and our police community services manager, Peter Alstrom, to make our presentation for this evening. Vicki, Ken, and Peter. Thank you, Suja, and <clears throat> good evening, council and uh, mayor and council. I'll start this off. Um, um, this has been a um, truly a team effort, like Suja was saying. I can't think of any other topic other than managing our parking resources, whether it's how we require parking for a new development or how we manage our parking supply in our lots and streets um, that crosses into every department's business and what an important matter it is because of that. And um, so what I'm going to do is uh, we have a PowerPoint presentation and I'll do part A, which will give us kind of the progress report and how we are meeting or how uh, so far what we've been doing in terms of progressing on the 12 recommendations of the parking management study. Um, it's interesting to know two things that the 12 recommendations very closely follow the policies of our mobility element related to goal four, which Suja has men mentioned. Um, and that, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Um, in 2017, I think we saw what was needed in terms of um, long range thinking about our parking and how we manage it. Um, secondly, because we are in the, the process of trying to uh, get full certification of our local coastal program with the Coastal Commission. Um, we had some grants approved to do that work, and it was the, those grants that helped fund, it, fund this particular part of how we manage our coastal resources. And parking, of course, is very closely related to the Coastal Commission's concern about uh, providing access to the coast to the general public, not just our local community, um, although we're included, but it's as well as visitors. So things align very well. We got this study paid for by the uh, Coastal Commission. But I think that's important to keep in mind because so much of uh, these proposals are something that we're going we're gonna to have to take through a Coastal Commission review and approval process. <clears throat> so I'll start with the um, first slide, um, or I guess it would be the next slide, Susan. Pass the pictures, yeah. So. Um, just to give an update on where we are, um, the first recommendation from the parking study is to implement an app-based mobile pay system. Um, this is something that uh, uh, the community services division through Peter has been working um, very diligently on over the last couple of years. Um, they distributed the RFP and we've received several proposals. And as you can see from the uh, table here, the vendor selection is happening very soon. Um, Peter will have a chance to uh, share a little more information on that later, but that's, so we are very close to implementing that app-based system. Um, recommendation two is to de design and implement a demand-based parking management program. Um, this has been a little harder to get a grasp on, um, but as you can see, the finance department has 
completed a survey of other cities to compare rates. Um, we did um, a pivot during the pandemic to change uh, lots A and C to change kind of the demand profile of those lots. But um, midterm and long term, how we look at rates will always be looked at in terms of a, um, a demand based system to try to encourage people to make their parking choices to um, whether it's to help downtown businesses or to uh, not impact the residents. So we'll have more to talk about on that later. Um, number three is to invest and implement a comprehensive parking signage and wayfinding system. Um, we have installed some new signs and um, we have a potential new capital improvements project up for an upgraded electronic sign for parking structure and additional parking signs where needed. And that's something the Public Works Department is working on in the near term. Um, next slide. Um, number four is pilot a shared parking program and facilitate shared parking. Um, our next step here will be to initiate a pilot program. Um, this is uh, intended more for sharing parking amongst private lots. So um, an example is a, a small example is a, that project on Pacific Coast Highway or Hope Chapel and the nearby office building entered a shared parking agreement. So um, we, um, that's something that's longer term, but uh, it's, a, it's an important part of, I guess, in terms of the parking studies goals to uh, maximize efficiency of our parking resources and take advantage and leverage some of the private parking resources. Um, number five. Um, is the uh, maximize flexibility of curb space to accommodate ride share in other modes and or valet service. Um, we have established ride share zones in downtown. Um, we did that a couple of years ago. And uh, we have a consultant currently engaged in study, including evaluations of these ride share lo zone locations. And so that is um, something that's already been partially implemented and in progress for um, review and upgrades. <clears throat> Item number six is reinvest parking revenues into multimodal improvements. Um, so far, there's been no action on this item. Um, and um, one of the things we didn't note here in next steps is the in lieu fee program and for private development projects that happen in the downtown area. And so we keep a separate account in the general fund exclusive for adding new spaces. Um, the Coastal Commission has requested that the city reevaluate the in-lieu fee parking program and fees this upcoming year. And so we do intend to do that. We have indicated to them that we will. And um, that's one part of the overall recommendation in terms of a longer term strategy or policy for uh, reallocating funds differently in the budget, that, that would be something that we would need some direction from the city council on. But I think um, you probably already, the council is aware, we've already made a lot of choices and of um, projects that have done things like Sharrows, um, bike rack parking, um, which is a way of kind of reallocating general fund revenues to different types of modes of transportation. Number seven is simplify is under simplify and leverage the zoning code is revise the zoning code to uh, support a better walkable mixed use development in the coastal zone. Um, as the council is aware, we have adopted the zoning code amendments for what, what we're calling our first phase amendments to achieve this recommendation. And those are relate to adaptive reuse of existing buildings and park and and um, that was adopted back in August of last year. Um, another step we've taken, back to my initial comments about making progress with the Coastal Commission is we have submitted our mobility element policies to the Coastal Commission as our first step in our uh, coastal local coastal program effort to get that updated and fully certified. We do, next steps, we do expect to complete the zoning code amendments towards the end of this year, which will include some more modifications to our zoning code in line with that, with that same goal. 
um, recommendation number eight, um, enhance event management practices to maximize parking system flexibility and predictability. Um, we have improved our um, ex, uh, information in terms of the availability of parking um, during events to event producers and the public. And the community resource department does require a parking plan for all events. And um, at some point we will, next steps is to link our app-based mobile pay system to special events once it is established. So this is something that has been work, um, being worked on by community resources department. And as you can see, as I go down this list, how many, just about every department gets involved in uh, parking, managing our parking. Number nine is a big, uh, is a big one. Um, the recommendation is to improve the residential parking permit program. Um, given that this is such a critical topic, we have a, a separate, we'll be discussing this in more detail later this afternoon. Um, and this is um, something that could be implemented. Some of the um, improvements could be implemented near term in terms of um, changing the uh, price structure. Um, but of course, this is related to the Coastal Commission's authority under the Coastal Development Permit, which established that program. So we'll, we'll, we'll be getting to more detail on that later. And number 10 is similar. Um, we'll be getting into more detail, and that's the Employee Parking Permit Program, which has part of it that does relate to the Residential Parking Permit Program and a separate program that has to do with monthly permits at the lots. And we'll talk in more detail about that later. Um, Vicki and Peter will be addressing those issues. And um, number 11 is establish an ongoing collection, monitoring and evaluation process. Um, we are still looking to initiate this process. It's not that we're not collecting data, we just haven't formally uh, coordinated it in a way to get the feedback we're looking for. And so that's, that's something that um, we'll be working with the uh, police department uh, and the public works department to try to figure out the best way to um, I tease out the data that will be most useful for us in, in you know in future future actions. And finally, and it was interesting back when we did the study, recommendation 12 seems like the most obvious one, but it was really didn't rise to the level of highest priority when we did this study um, because providing additional public parking as needed and investing in new public parking um, is seen as kind of an old way of doing things. And Again, we're trying to maximize our existing parking resources and recognize how uh, the world is changing with respect to how people get around and how they, and, and other goals of our mobility element. That said, um, we have initiated discussions with the Hermosa Beach School District for shared use of Valley School parking, um, which would, could be very useful to help with um, our downtown businesses whether that could be shared for some kind of valet program or supplemental parking for surge events or whatever. So um, that's, a, that's a great partnership and kind of fits under recommendation number four, I believe it was, the, the idea of using existing parking facilities in a more creative way. And, um, but at this point, um, we just have initiated this discussions, but it could lead to some kind of joint use agreements with the school district uh, related to that. So um, that concludes, next slide. That concludes kind of the overview. Um, and what we can go on to a more detailed discussion and meter parking lot rates and parking citation fines that we um, set forth in the staff report. And I will pass that on to uh, Peter, I believe. Peter, are you covering that or is Vicki? Vicki is going to begin with the parking meter and parking lot rates, Ken. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Thanks, Peter. It's a tag team for this part, I think. <laughs> um, I wanted to start. There are a couple of um, sentences from the parking study that we did, didn't make it into the slides, and I thought I would just start off with those. Um, it talks about often on street prices cost less than off street, on, I'm sorry, on street prices typically cost less than off-street prices, which can provide incentive for drivers to circle and wait in traffic to find the best deal. 
also say that ideally with demand-based programs, it would allow the off-street parking to be a cheaper long-term option as opposed to using on-street spaces for long-term parking. So um, <clears throat> in looking at the slide, if you roll up the slide just a bit there, um, this tells you that our current rates are $1.25 from 10 in the morning till eight at night. And then the demand part comes in, they uh, switch over from 8 p.m. to 2 a.m. to 1.50. And this, the rest of the chart just gives you a little history there of uh, when those uh, rates were implemented and when they were last increased. Um, we did do um, a survey of other cities, and that is on uh, the attachment B1 in your report. I wasn't planning, <clears throat> excuse me, necessarily to go through those. Um, I think you'll note that um, probably Manhattan Beach is the highest with uh, $2.50 in the lots and $2 on the street meters. So mainly we've given you uh, these surveys of the other cities, just food for thought and just, um, you know, so that you have an understanding of what the other cities are in fact doing. And I think that's it for um, what I have on the, 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 lead, the meters and the lots. I think the, the basic recommendation is the um, differentiation perhaps between the off street and the on street and then just to take a look at what, you know, where do you feel the rate should be uh, given uh, some of the, the neighbors. Do you have comments, Peter? No? No, Vicki, thank you. Okay. All right, the next area uh, is not part of the coastal plan, but since it, we're talking about parking, we felt that we would include the parking fines. Uh, we had given you, as I said in the report, uh, we had given the council um, back in 1819, we had surveyed some of the most often um, issued tickets and re made a recommendation there. And then the council asked us to come back with a survey of all the parking fines uh, so you will uh, find that on attachments B2 and B3. And again, it's just for information. Uh, we have a detail chart that shows each city and what their parking violation rates are. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we have a summary of that that uh, shows you the average of those citations. Um, food for information. Um, Peter has some recommendations on those charts uh, for safety violations that he would recommend we make those a little bit higher just by the nature of those and he can probably um, explain that to you um, and i guess that's the number two uh, is that number two peter on the slide the um safety related yes it is vicky thank you I, it, again just separate getting out the general violations from those that um, are safety related and have a direct impact on pedestrian and bicyclist safety in the community. Mm -hmm. okay. Do you have any other questions? Uh, you can roll up there. I think parking time limits, that may be yours, Peter, Susan, if you wouldn't mind, thank you. All right, thank you. So, um, Council, as I'm, I'm sure you remember, we went through a period in 2020 when we were opening and closing our lots. And um, at this time, lot A and lot C are still limited to a three hour maximum purchase time. They were at one time uh, 24 hours. And so that is something uh, that we would suggest considering tonight and as well, um, future time limits uh, could be considered with a uh, demand-based parking program. And that would likely tie into uh, the pay by app or mobile payment system as well, as that rolls out and gives us uh, some better data regarding uh, use in the city. Thank you. Any questions about any of that so far? 
we can always come back at the end as well. Okay, you can go ahead, uh, Susan, please. Next slide. So on to the uh, parking permit program. Um, I know that there was a question about the purpose of the program. And although that's not on the slide, I thought I would just go over that briefly um, as far as it's stated in the study. Um, the program was developed to discourage oversaturation of the city's downtown and coastal permit parking to provide free long-term parking at inland locations and to allow residents within the impacted area to park beyond the one hour time restrictions or without having to pay the meter at yellow pole caps. So that's the purpose as stated um, in this area. And it is, it is called the impacted area because of the flux of um, visitors to, to the coastal area, of course. Um, page seven of the, well, that was page seven of the report. The report, the rates are $40 for each sticker currently. Um, there's a sticker and there's a transferable permit. Um, they're the same price. Um, each resident that has a, a, a vehicle registered to their address may purchase one sticker for each vehicle, and there's no limit on that. Uh, the transferable permits, which are also called guest permits, you may have one per household. Again, one, one per address. Um, and, you know, it's been observed and it's pretty clear um, that that results in too many permits, in fact, uh, being sold. Uh, we, on page um, attachment C3, um, is a summary of the, the permits that are sold by year. I think there was a supplemental sent out to you on, on this one as well. And uh, for the latest year, which was 2021, there were 9,677 uh, permits sold. Um, of those, uh, 4,222 were guest permits and 5,272 were vehicle permits. And then 183 were employee permits, which we'll get to in a moment. But those are, uh, the employee permits are also part of this residential parking permit. There's also in the report um, on page nine, a table of the permits per address, because there's been a lot of talk, obviously, uh, with no limit on the permits, how many permits are issued by address. So we did a table for you to show you uh, how many um, permits were sold at some of the addresses. There, there's the highest one is one, one residence had 25 permits at the upper level. And then at the lower level, there are 900 addresses that are only issued one permit. So you can sort of look up and down that scale and see you know, what, what number you think is right and uh, how many people really have uh, an excessive number of permits, but that they do have cars to go with those because that's what's required to issue it. It's just that there is no limit. So on the slide before us, um, this is what the parking study recommended, that it be limited to four per household. Uh, that includes um, one transferable permit, I believe. And then the the fees be staggered, as you see below, uh, the first at 50, second, 75, third, 100, and then that last one, 150 for the guest permit that's transferable. And then also uh, in the study, which we haven't gone into a lot of detail here, but is the consideration of a district-based residential uh, parking zone, which currently we only have one zone, and uh, I believe the study uh, recommended uh, having several more than that. Uh, I don't know, um, Ken, did you want to comment on that at all at this time or? Yeah, um, as one of the reasons we haven't gone into detail of the parking study is that the you know, purpose of tonight's meeting was to kind of give a progress report. Um, you may recall the parking study divided up our parking area into eight districts, but that was kind of for purpose of gathering data. Um, they refer to a program in Newport Beach where Newport Beach settled on three districts. So um, my sense is that this is kind of a longer term thing we need to think about after we 
perhaps see how our next stage goes with incremental changes to the pricing. Um, and um, so we can have a better sense of how many districts and where those should be. I think Peter would tell you eight districts would be a challenge to manage operationally. And so what that right number would be is something I think that requires some more research. Um, one of the things I want to talk about too about the residential parking permit program, just kind of a, a, a coastal commission authority level is, and it's in the report, but I just, I think it should be emphasized and everyone to understand is that this parking, it's called the preferential parking district program under the um, coastal development permit we have that dates back to 1984. Um, it's a kind of permission for um, creating preferential parking on our streets for our residents. It goes back to our city having a lot of properties back in that era, and we still do, that are under parked on their private property. And so the streets have become kind of the de facto place for our residents to park. Um, for, it depends on how you look at it, but it's the city is fortunate to have this program. Um, it does create some privileges. Um, the boundaries that were created back in 1984 are pretty much set in stone. We, we did one modification back in 2000 where we added Cypress Street and that was, you know, we had to go through a coastal commission hearing process to get that small change. So everything about this program creates uh, challenges in terms of dealing with the coastal commission. Um, and, you know, I would just strongly recommend that if you think about this as kind of a one-off thing to change, it's, I would like us to think of this in terms of comprehensively of all the other programs that we're bringing to the coastal commission is uh, something that will be important as part of our discussions with them. Um, they should generally support something that um, makes the pricing more close to what a market rate would be. I, I mean, I'm sure these rates are still well below market rate, but, but it should create a demand situation that's better for coastal access and help us with discussions with them on some of our other objectives. So I, I hope I didn't get too far off track there, but I just want to just make it clear how the Coastal Commission is such an in integral part of any changes we make to this program. Okay, Susan, if you could move to the next uh, slide, please. So the employee parking permit, um, we have the parking study recommendation there of uh, having it remain, but um, the city updating the locations and pricing to encourage off-street parking availability for employees and that on-street parking be reserved for short-time users um, to promote turnover. Uh, as we said before, the employee permits are part of the residential parking permit program. Uh, they're the same as the $40 permits, but the price is uh, $143 for an employee. Uh, they may park with those at the yellow capped or posted uh, meters. And then there are also um, lot permits that employees may, they don't have to be an employee, anybody can buy one, but we believe that uh, some employees do purchase the, the lot permits. And that's, I believe that's on page 10 of your report. Um, there's a $31 permit that uh, you can park for five, from five to 7 p.m in either of the lots, or you can buy one for $62 and you can park in the lots anytime up to 72 hours. So that is the current uh, employee parking. We did do a survey on employee parking for the other cities, which is on page 11 of the report. Um, it, you know, it's interesting, but they're kind of all over the place. So I'm not sure uh, that it really uh, provides information other than you know what the other cities do. Uh, it's not necessarily like our program, so it's it's not that comparable, I don't think. I believe that was it um, as far as what we were providing on this. There are 183 of the employee permits that were issued last year for the preferential parking district. So that gives you an idea of how many there are out of the 9,000 some odd. 
So Susan, you can go to the next slide. And I believe Doug may be going to cover this one or Ken. No, thank, thank you, Vicki. Um, and so this slide, you know, concerns electric vehicle charging, public electric vehicle charging. Uh, the city has 34 chargers around town, uh, most of which are designed to be used by the public. Uh, um, some of those are for city vehicles as well. And currently the city does not charge um, for any of those except the fast chargers on the parking structure, um, which are operated by a third party and, and they charge uh, and, and collect that revenue. Um, so all the level two chargers around town are free to the public, which, um, you know, is certainly uh, welcomed by the public. And I think originally was intended to, you know, encourage EV purchase and use, uh, in, in Hermosa and the region. Um, nowadays, the cars are much more commonplace. Um, and so that incentive maybe is not as uh, effective as it once was. Um, an option which has been discussed uh, previously in 2019, um, at the time council directed staff to continue with a, a free program, but uh, the city does have the option of charging um, at those meters or at those chargers. Um, it, and there's a variety of, of strategies on that, uh, whether it's you know, a very minimal fee that just covers the, the power costs, um, or there can be graduated rates that go up as the car is there to kind of encourage turnover. Um, and, and of course, higher rates to generate a little bit of revenue that can be put into, into the program itself. Um, so that is, that is the, the current state of, of each EV charging in, in Hermosa Beach. Not sure who's next there. Okay. Um, I think I was going to close this out. Um, this is a, I do have a couple of closing comments before we get into questions and discussion. Um, I know I've already harped on the Coastal Commission Authority with respect to the residential parking permit program. Um, but I, I just want to speak to that generally as well. Um, we are closely working with the Coastal Commission staff to try to move forward on our local coastal program. Um, I think a lot of you understand how important that is. It, it's a way that the city can get to a point where we issue our own coastal development permits. Um, but to get there, we have to establish um, a policies and a program in our, what's called the local or in our land use plan that's acceptable to the Coastal Commission. So in starting that work, um, we, have a, we have a lot of work to do. And I think it just speaks to how we need to look at these parking, whether it's adjustments in pricing, or um, you know, adjustments in some of our programs. Uh, uh, you know, be strategic about which ones we take on now and which ones that we should uh, kind of walk slowly through the process. And so um, you'll see in our staff report that we do address that issue about Coastal Commission authority, um, because in essence, all our, most of our parking resources were, that involve parking meters. And of course, the residential permit districts are in the coastal zone. So we do not have our own uh, jurisdiction there to deal with these issues because it's so closely related to Coastal Act requirements about access to the coast. So I just wanted to close on that. Um, Suja, I don't know if you have any closing comments before we get into questions, but um, I, I'm certainly open for any questions. Absolutely. I wanted to thank Ken, Vicki, and Peter as well as Doug for the brief presentation, somewhat brief presentation. I know we shared a lot of information with you in the staff report, as well as just some 
raw information on rates and the numbers of permits and some comparisons with other cities. It's not exhaustive, but I think we provided information on some of the critical data that you needed. However, you know, it may not be perfect in the way that you're looking for it. And so I want to just field questions and see if we can perhaps provide responses to some unanswered questions you may have or some data that might we may not have provided and, and you'd like to have more information on. So if we could do that, Mr. Mayor, that'd be great. Sounds good. Thank you, Madam City Manager. I just want to echo your comments. Thank you to Ken, Peter, Doug, and Vicki as well for this report. There's a lot of information if you're listening to dig into um, for the public. A lot of different comparison tables in the staff report. So uh, when you have some free time, definitely dig into that. And I will kick it over to my colleagues for any questions if anyone wants to start it off. Mr. Mayor, I just have a like a procedural question. Uh, I mean, this is a really big topic um, with lots of nuances through it, as we saw in the presentation in the staff report. I wonder, I mean, I'm happy to, you know, for us to just ask questions, but do we want to put um, topics into buckets to talk about um, so that we can have a more refined conversation or are we just throwing it all out there? Um, I think we could definitely we go back to the staff report, we can kind of focus on the parking meter rates and fines first and then get into the two parking permits afterwards. Um, is that kind of what you had in mind? Yeah, I'm thinking, yeah, if we can categorize them, then maybe we can be more efficient with our conversation and questions. Absolutely. Okay. My yeah, questions are kind of all over the place, but I'll, I'll refine them right now as uh, the mayor pro tem kicks it off. Am I kicking off? <laughs> Thank you. Um, no, I, you know, this is, you know, what's the old adage? How do you eat an elephant? Uh, you know, one bite at a time. So I, I think the only way to, to eat this vexing beast of an animal called parking is, is one bite at a time. So um, what category would you like to start with? We're starting with the street meter and parking lot. Let's do that. And okay. then if you want to throw fines in there as well. Okay. So um, I will start, just start rattling off questions then. Um, so right now our parking meters start charging at 10. Is there any reason it's 10 and not eight? Could we start charging at eight o'clock in the morning as opposed to 10? Um, council member, we, we could in terms of, uh, program the mean programming, the meters, that's not an issue. Um, they'll start whenever we tell them they need to start. Um, the, the other issue though, I believe, and Ken will have to chime in could be a coastal commission issue as well. Okay. I mean, but I, from my understanding, most other cities, uh, in our coastal zone start earlier versus later. I think we are the latest starting city, if that's my understanding, if my understanding is correct. And I've always wondered why we start at 10 and miss out on a lot of revenue from eight to 10. So, um, so understanding that uh, that may be a coastal commission issue then. Uh, um, so with that being said, is there also a way, Peter, that we could switch our two hour meters to three hours after 6 p.m. Um, you know, since I've been here, I've heard questions and, and folks say, hey, why after six, why, you know, can I, can I ex you know, have dinner over three hours as opposed to two and not worry about, or feed the meter for three hours as opposed to two and not worry about rushing back after my glass of wine? We can certainly do that. Um, the only, uh, items that, of course, we would want to consider uh, staff time to change out right. signage. Uh, understand, towels. yes. I, I certainly understand yeah. all the logistics. Yeah, it's not just an easy magic. We're going to flip the switch tomorrow. Right. Understanding signage and public notification and all that. But we could, we could flip a switch at some point and change our metered 
parking to three hours after 6 p.m. if we so choose? We, we could, um, and again, I, I just have to put the caveat out there that, and Ken has so much more experience with the Coastal Commission <laughs> that I would have to put that caveat out there that, that uh, he would need to, to chime in there. Okay. Mayor Pratem, if, um, maybe if we could, since that will likely be the answer for a lot of the questions, I'm wondering if I can bring Ken back on and he could go over the process for any package of changes. So we likely would not recommend doing something piecemeal, but perhaps if there were a packet of changes you wanted to consider, Ken, let us know what that process is. You know, there was a time that some very small modifications could just be approved administratively with the staff. And what we found out recently is they'd like us to go to the full commission for just about any change that we'd like to make. So Ken, do you want to explain that so that we have this overarching, at least set of parameters and understanding that everything needs to go. I wish I could say I could uh, perfectly understand where the Coastal Commission would take some of the stuff, but I don't because they do change. Like Suja mentioned, they used to have some very clear guidance where you could do parking meter rate increases of 25% every four years. And it was just a simple process of notifying them. Recently, they pulled back on that and said that any price changes you have to bring to them, and then they decide if they're going to approve it administratively or take you to a more kind of full permitting process. Now, is that when Manhattan um, Beach went through when they increased theirs to two and two fifty? Yeah, but it goes back to some. They went through that more simple process because they have a certified LCP. So they take took those price changes to the Coastal Commission and it wasn't appealed. And so it was kind of like, it was like they did it themselves and just the, let the commission know and no one appealed. Um, but they're under a different, it, they're under a whole different set of rules because they have a certified local coastal program. So that speaks to how we get behind the eight ball a little bit by not having that yet. Um, all that said, the two things you mentioned, changing the morning, um, I, I mean, it, it, and those slight changes in the hours, those are the kind of things, I, I, the way I tried to phase it in the staff report is we had some direction on some minor adjustments that were important to you. We could ask the Coastal Commission in context of our overall program to make sure, you know, if we had some kind of assurance that these minor changes are something they could approve without, you know, jeopardizing everything else. Um, I would think those kind of things wouldn't be a big deal, but I, I you know, it's just hard to predict. And My can, sense is that, yeah, and Susan, maybe you want to speak to that because Susan has experience with dealing with the Coastal Commission as well, as we all know. But. And I was going to ask you, maybe you can elaborate a little bit when we say having it, having our council's recommendations as part of a package that doesn't end up jeopardizing other things. What do we mean by that? Jeopardizing? Um, yeah, jeopardizing. My, in terms of like our overall plan, we wouldn't want to uh, cause them to want us to totally rethink our residential parking permit program, for example, or um, we have uh, pending mobility element policies which relate to our new parking programs in terms of reduced parking requirements. So it's all part of this, their concern about overall our actions somehow affecting the ability of visitors to park at a reasonable price in Hermosa Beach. And they all relate to each other. And that's uh, one of the reasons we got I, we think this study really is the approach, bringing a comprehensive set of recommendations that fit in with the goals that we're in the process of trying to get the Coastal Commission to agree to. Jack, I certainly understand that, but I mean, I I can't see how they would object, you know, if, if we look at our residential parking permit and what appears to be abuses, I mean, if we have a single resident with 25 vehicles registered to a single resident and we were reduced that to three or maybe four, that's, uh, you know, I'm no math major, but that's 20, 21 potential 
parking spaces that would be available for the public to use. Right? So, so I, the I, number, go ahead, I'm sorry. So I, am I missing something here? So the number of parking spaces, not parking spaces, sorry, the number of parking permits wouldn't comport to the number of spaces available on the street necessarily. We could assume that there's less use if, if there are less sold, but not a one for one exchange. And, and so you're right. I think it is moving in the right direction by reducing perhaps the number of residential permits that are sold. And, and your question is, wouldn't that be appealing to the Coastal Commission? And wouldn't it appear as though we are working toward the goal of opening up parking for visitor serving purposes? And, and that's how we would share that direction if that was the direction of the council um, to implement strategies that reduce the number of permits that were sold per um, especially if it's after a certain number. The other thing you had asked about the amount of time that the meters are effective in the evening. And so Ken, would, would the meter timing from two hours to three hours be considered impactful to visitor serving goals in a I, negative way? I don't think so. Um, I think it's very similar. I've Redondo Beach just recently implemented, I think, up to four hours in the evening. Um, I noticed that last time I was down there. So, um, but again, it's just a matter of asking first. I, I don't want us to go and do these things without having that conversation with the Coastal Commission staff that certain adjustments like that are something they can just consider reasonable and minor and not affect the other things, for lack of a better word, that we're negotiating with them. Okay, I, I certainly understand, but I mean, raising our rates or ensuring that our rates are based on fair market value, it, it does, shouldn't impact accessibility, right? I mean, Coastal Commission's concern is access. And if we are looking to modify our rates to so that they comport more with what's fair in the current market and not essentially a giveaway, which is what I think we have now, then I, I can't see Coastal Commission really balking at that. But anyway, I understand the Coastal Commission issue and, and we'll certainly address that when we need to. Um, so, the, so we talked about the two hour, the three hour meter parking spots. Oh, oh Ken, real quick, you talked about reinvesting parking revenues um, in your presentation, could we, if we so decided, could we reinvest our parking revenues back into the community, into street beautification, signage, lights, uh, sidewalk improvements, all those things that uh, we are in dire need of doing as opposed to directing these funds uh, go into the general fund. Is that something that we could do? Um, I think that's probably a question more for this for Susan, in terms of how we allocate resources. So during the budget process, council has the opportunity to, to provide direction. And so in terms of general fund expenditures, so there are streams of funds that contributed, contribute to general funds. We don't earmark. I think what you're asking is, can you, are you asking if you can earmark parking revenue to directly go into a specific expenditure? And um, council prior, when council shares its priorities with us, through the CIP program or, or other means, most often those funds do come from general funds. So it, it is all, it's all there and it's all contributing to it. No, I, I certainly understand that. But you know, oftentimes people like to see what they're getting for their tax dollars. And I, and I certainly understand the, the general fund usage. Um, but if, we are going to ask residents to pay more for their 
residential parking permits. And if we're gonna raise fees for our visitors and guests, would it make sense to then say those dollars collected would go into the betterment of the streets and beautification boxes and whatnot? So you, you will see the, the, the benefit of, your, of the increase. That's all I'm asking, if, if, if that makes sense. And if it doesn't, then it doesn't. I think that's a policy decision that council can make. Um, having flexibility in how the general fund resources are applied, I think can demonstrate greater value depending on how we are able to articulate it. So in our CIP program, the funds that are, that are needed, if we are accelerating a program, assuming that staffing is not an issue, if we accelerate a program, we can articulate that it is through revenue increases that we are able to accelerate um, any one of the programs. Does it make sense as more of a policy question if, if council felt it needed to make that direct link, then certainly, however, every public service that is that we're able to provide to the community, to businesses, to visitors, they're all funded um, with, with general fund support. And, and so we can make that more visible if there is if there are increases in revenue that we're able to show, but, but making that direct link and tying those funds to only a certain expenditure, I wouldn't recommend. Okay. Um, so can, all right, so we are still on our metered parking. Can, residents and employees park on the me in any of the metered spots with a permit that they purchase. The, oh. So I, I guess my question is what permits outside of the residential parking permits for those Loma and West are there any permits that other residents can purchase to park at any of the other metered locations within our city? I don't believe it, the meters, but the lot permits that I mentioned, those may be purchased by anyone. Uh, the one that's $31 and the one that's 60, $62, those may be purchased by anyone to park in the, the lots and the parking structure. Okay. And the, the, the two lots in particular, lots A and I believe it's C, right? Um, C is the parking structure. Oh, yes. sorry. So it's A and B then. Those are the two big ones, right? Am I correct? Well, the, A, big, A, one, the, the big one is the structure. B is the one behind um, the north side of the plaza. It's a small lot. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, is it my understanding that those parking lots are our most lucrative parking lots within mm -hmm. the city? Yes. Okay. All right. They're so, metered. And those are metered, right? Yes. Okay. That's all I have on the on the meters, Mr. Mayor, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Anyone else for meters or fines? Yes, Councilwoman Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I don't know that these are, are pertain to the meters per se, but they pertain to the overall discussion about how we um, might give guidance tonight. So I don't know if that's this is the appropriate time or not, but I, I wrote down my questions kind of in order of the conversation. So um, some of them are really quick. Let's hear so is this appropriate for that? Okay. All right. Um, I want to start by saying thanking the staff for the tag team. <laughs> thanking this 
Thank you very much. Um, a lot of you involved in this very important issue. So um, regarding the local coastal plan and uh, that process, and as it relates to you know, coastal access and, and all things parking, what is our anticipated timeline for that process to um, play out, if we know? So what we, in order to make progress in a meaningful way, we decided to come to council um, requesting the permission to do this piece by piece. And so you may recall that we asked you to allow us to address the six, I think six, seven elements of, of that LCP approval process into bite-sized pieces. And each piece, I shouldn't say bite-sized, it's pretty big. So we started with mobility. So Ken, that's where we started. Is there a timeline that we can assign to, if we were able to do one piece at a time without hiring a dedicated staff person that only reviews, not reviews, that only is working on this? What, what is your thought on the timeline? I'd have to say it's one of the hardest things to put a timeline to because we're dealing with a, a state agency. Um, in terms of our own capacity, um, trying to do this in-house, um, you know, we're looking at anywhere from another year and a half to three to five years. Um, which I know sounds doesn't sound very appealing, but that's just kind of the reality. Um, I, you know, it's something we could talk about next budget cycle if we want to bring in more resources to bear on this particular project. Um, but it's it was interesting when we were strategizing about doing the mobility element part of it first. We think that's the easiest part, um, the next the part of the deal uh, getting like our development codes. And like our you know, our zoning coordinates update as part of a certified local coastal program is uh, uh, going to be quite challenging as well. So, um, so that's my best guess, and it's it's hard to really hard to pin down. Um, the coastal commission changes their policies and approaches so frequently. Um, their guidance isn't very helpful, frankly. But um, there are. Um, possible uh, ways to approach that and will be one of the things I want to work on work on before I uh, retire so in terms of trying to get a work program that makes sense for us yeah I, I appreciate that uh, I, I think it's a really important question the reason I ask is that uh, as was stated by staff more than one way multiple ways this is all interrelated and the local coastal plan is paramount to implementing our long range planning. So um, that's gives me a lot of pause, frankly. <clears throat> Real I think this is a quick question. The app based systems for meters. Is that require a change in hardware? Uh, Peter, you might know, because we just changed a bunch of the heads of those. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, we did. So, um, no, it does not. Um, the, the there are two uh, there are two separate components in the mobile payment system. Um, to make a long story short, those are our license plate based uh, enforcement systems, and so we would be using that to enforce as opposed to. Um, the information that the meter displays. That being said, um, there is the possibility that in the future uh, with some of these systems, and again, we have an outstanding RFP, so I want to be careful about what I say here. Um, we, we could communicate, uh, the app could communicate with the meter heads. I hope that answers your question. Well, it does, because I know there was a fairly significant investment in, in the change out of those that hardware, I don't know if hardware is the right term, but I think we, we all know it, what I mean by that. Um, okay, thank you for that. Um, 
a really quick question about the added signage. I don't recall if it was um, who spoke to that, but can anyone just say quickly where signage has been added thus far? Uh, just kind of characterize that a little bit so we have a sense of that. Parking, I, I assume it's parking related <laughs> signage. So Peter, I think you had referenced uh, that signage would have to change for any any of these changes. So, okay, I'm sorry. Um, somebody said that new signs, some new signage has been added already. I don't recall who said that. So I was just curious about oh. where. I, I'm sorry. I think there's I think there's some confusion over the question. Um, Ken, um, that was uh, actually a, a comment that came out of your um, department. <clears throat> that Christy had noted. Okay. Um, you're talking about the um, the wayfinding signage to like the remote beach access parking, that kind of thing. Yeah, we did an update to that. But it was referenced. Yeah. yeah. Um, a few years ago, I know we did some improvements to a lot of those signs. Um, so I, 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 I guess that's where it's at. It really was, it was something the public works department took the lead on, but we were involved to make sure it met the terms of the uh, preferential parking district program permit, which is contingent on providing signage to help people find the free remote access parking. Okay. I just know it come, a reason I ask is it comes up a lot that we need more signage to direct people to places and also parking. And so I was curious if we could convey what's what's been added um, since you referenced that we've already done some. Um, so I'm happy to, to, you know, to wait for clarification on that if, if needed. Um, <clears throat> do we know, do we have, have we done any inventory yet about the potential for shared parking pilot program. So you mentioned the one regarding Hope Chapel. Do we even know, um, we have a sense of how many potential locations yet might um, be a candidate for that? And if so, how much parking it could yield? Um. It's, I think we did some initial work on that, and if I, I can get that information for you probably here later this evening from Christy, so okay. I'll get back to you on that. And she, okay. and she did get back to me about the sign question. Um, they, there were signs installed, installed along Valley Drive near Clark Building and signs in the Cypress District because some of the remote parking is in those areas, and that's where some of the signage hadn't been upgrade, up, you know, updated in quite a while. But I can get back to you on that for your other question. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> apologize if, if I sh maybe should be clear about this, but, but Ken, when you talked about the update to the zoning codes uh, that were ongoing currently, is that set of updates in service of the local coastal plan um, to be completed before we have a local coastal plan. I'm guessing. Um, yeah, so um, when we did those uh, first round of amendments, we were comfortable that they were consistent with the general policies we have in the land use plan, as well as what in the Coastal Act. Um, the proof's gonna be in the pudding when we get an applicant that takes advantage of those new codes and then has to get a coastal development permit. Um, so there's still an unpredictability in the process till we get all that into a certified program. Um, so I, when you say um, it could be a couple to five years, if we work through the local zoning changes related to Plan Hermosa, that would not be finally blessed until the local coastal plan is complete and comprehensive and blessed by the local 
Coastal Commission, correct? Um, that's correct. Um, okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, um, but in the meantime, since we are uncertified under their terminology, I don't necessarily think the statute characterizes that way. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a bit of we're at their um, whims a little bit in terms of their feeling on whether particular projects are consistent with the Coastal Act. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you. Um, now, specific to the meters, I was sort of over, <laughs> for whatever reason, it was in my face looking at this material, uh, how low the rates are to park publicly at, at the coast compared to, say, downtown Los Angeles. <laughs> and is that very specific to the fact that it is a coast, it is a beach, it is a public, you know, domain where, we, uh, I mean, there's extra interest because of the Coastal Act to make the coastlines um, accessible, which includes the price point to, 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 to get there and to park your car there versus say downtown anywhere. Is that why, uh, because the prices up and down the coast, they're, they're pretty cheap compared to uh, other areas in the region. Um, yeah, that's correct. Okay. Um, it's a, you, you're talking about other areas that can use a basically a market value demand based equation. We don't have the authority to do that. Um, um, the Coastal Commission used to give us some clear guidance that we could work with them, but um, not so much lately. So it's kind of like, if we want to make some adjustments, we need to ask them to see if it fits under their concept of what's uh, appropriate for coastal access. Okay. Um, uh, I was curious about your reference to 1984. Uh, and then there was only one shift. You, I, I might not get this right, but you said it's basically set in stone and yet there was one change and it involved Cyprus. Do you recall what, why there was a change on Cyprus? Yeah, and it's just that one block of Cyprus um, that's uh, south of Pier Avenue. So it's that it's a residential district of Cyprus. Mm -hmm. It was a group of residents that lobbied the city to make that application for a change to add that one block. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of change in the boundaries, I guess I was trying to point out is possible, but it does require a full review and approval mm -hmm. by the Coastal Commission. And you'll see our latest version of our permit is dated to I think it's in 2003 or four when we did that. Mm -hmm. And that's when they updated the specificity of where all our free remote parking is supposed to be. Um, that's how much in the details they get into that because it is a permit through them. Okay, all right. Um, and I, I'll ask one more question at this stage and that is about what you said, Ken, regarding um, the comprehensive process that we are in and the approach and we and the fact that you cautioned us, we need to be quite strategic about uh, the conversation that we're in tonight regarding parking, because it's just one element of a larger set of issues. Um, do I have that part right? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I want to ask you kind of point blank, if from your perspective and in your role, uh, would it be smarter to not necessarily, or or what would be the trade-offs? Maybe better better asked, what would be the trade-offs to trying to um, piecemeal some parking items that are part and parcel to a bigger conversation about a local coastal plan in the future of Hermosa? Um, versus taking the time to make sure we have all the pieces before we present our set of requests and recommendations to the Coastal Commission. If that 
I, I know it's kind of a big holistic question, but that's actually one of the things that is most concerning to me is trying to do something in a silo that's that's related to a comprehensive equation of things that dictate the future of this city. Um, and, and the need for Coastal Commission to be a good partner in that process and for us reciprocally to be a, a good partner in that process. So, uh, Councilor. Thank you. And I know Ken will add to this. I just wanted to share, I think, I think in the large con larger context, absolutely, it would be better to have a package. However, what staff would like to do is look at the recommendations that you all have, and we can package this, the ones that are not as, they're all of consequence, but not as big as others and, and have a conversation with the Coastal Commission staff and see, would they allow us to process a couple of them, certain number of them based on, on what they are through an administrative review process? Um, we're not, and Ken already said this and I, I don't want, I'm not trying to repeat it, but because we don't have a guidance, I don't want to rule out that council can make changes. I think you can. So as, as this evening progresses and you make your recommendations and, and down the road at a council meeting, you take action. We, we can take those items and categorize them, do some internal workshopping and, and float the ones that we believe are not upsetting that larger picture that the council wants to achieve through your economic development plan, all of the efforts that you are making. Um, I think we can, we can assess those because what we've heard from you this evening at other times is there are some minor tweaks that you'd like to make. And, and I don't wanna rule out that, that's, that, that that is possible. I, I would think that they are. We, we're just not able to say absolutely. Okay, so if I could um, echo what I, I feel like I'm hearing in, in your answer, Madam City Manager, especially for, and, and Mayor Pro Tem spoke, I think similarly to some of these issues being maybe, I, I guess I would, I would call them potentially less weighty or controversial in the grand scheme of, of everything the Coastal Commission cares about. And so it would not necessarily, what I'm hearing you say is it would not necessarily be a big detractor to our longer term goals with the local coastal plan to potentially work with the Coastal Commission on um, a strategically select smaller list of items that, that um, may be kind of more obvious things um, in the shorter term. Is, is that a fair statement? Yes. Okay. And we've, we've been working with the staff on different projects, whether it's in a partnership with the school district or some of the other um, items that have gone through the planning commission. And, and we, I feel that we are working in partnership with them. They have come to support the city during the the, the policy changes or, or practices that uh, we had asked you to put in place and consider during COVID. Things that we would not have predicted that they would have done previously. And so in continuing with that partnership, I, I think the best way for us to approach this is have them let us know what's, what's something that they would not want to consider without looking at the preferential parking permit program um, or something that they don't want to consider without us getting farther along with the LCP process. What, and Ken can affirm this, what we've seen is that there is an allowance for some adjustments and progress to make because cities aren't static and conditions aren't static. And so I, I have faith that we, there are things that we could go to them that you'd like to see adjusted sooner than when the larger package is put together. Okay, um, I appreciate that. And, you know, in, in caution, I guess in my mind too, not wanting to delay um, a number of other very important priorities related to 
this in part, you know, as one part. All right, I will, um, I will pause there. Mr. Mayor, thank you very much. Thank you. Look to my other two colleagues. Anything specific on parking meters or fines? And just to remind the kind of the two staff recommendations in the report were eliminate the temporary emergency orders at lot A and lot C and push them back to 24 hours and then the future time limits with the demand based parking permits or parking uh, in those structures as well. Any other thoughts? Stacey or Justin, good with those two? Perfect. Yes. Mayor Mayor Portem. Portem. Yeah. Since we're talking parking structures that aren't per se meters, I, I'm curious as to why we have parking passes that residents can buy for downtown structures and lots. That is a significantly reduced permit. Do you, anybody know the history or the impetus of, of that? If I'm understanding it correctly, anybody can buy any number of parking permits to be used in our structure and our lots at $31 and $62 a month. Is that correct? Vicki, you're, you're on mute. Um, yes, that's correct. Yeah. And do we have a lot of residents who utilize that program? Uh, let me see if I can find the stats. It's not right in the report here, but I may have something that'll tell us those numbers. Have any other questions? I'll, I'll try to find it while you're... No, that, that was it on that. And you can get back to me on that, Vicki. That's fine. Okay. So just bring the conversation back. Um, doesn't sound like there's gonna be too much motivation to change parking rates at the meters minus maybe uh, increasing the hours down to 8 a.m. I don't know if there's so much support for that uh, or just bringing an item forward uh, specifically on those uh, uh, those specific changes with the parking meet, uh, meters. But as far as my colleagues, would you guys like to have a item in the future to remove the temporary emergency orders for lot A and lot C. Bring it back to the council later. Yes, Councilmember Massey. Yeah, definitely on that one. I wanted to say that um, I think our parking rates across the board should be reviewed. I think they're all out of date. That would include parking meters as well as the parking structures, as well as the uh, parking permits. So I didn't want you to think that you know, because I didn't have any questions on this particular item that I thought that uh, our parking meter rates uh, were what we should stick with. Okay. Yes, Mayor Pertim. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to add to the, what Justin said. I, I also agree. I think um, we certainly need to look at our per hour metered rates. I think they're ridiculously low and to the extent there is an agreement we should look to increase those rates sooner versus later. And uh, I'm not sure why we should have a permit program for residents to park at a greatly reduced rate in our structures and lots that should, in my mind, be used for visitors who are coming into the city who are looking to spend money um, and will pay to park. I mean, at $31 and $62, that is significantly cheaper than what a visitor would pay. So I'm not sure why we have residents taking up parking that should be used for, <coughs> designated for visitors. Um, so I think that should be part of any consideration as well as to who can park, when, and then for how much. I mean, those are really the three essential issues in my mind. Okay. Mayor, Mayor, may I make a correction? Yes. 
um, I just wanted to say that the lot permits anyone, including visitors, can buy. It's not just for residents. I just want to make sure that that was clear. And just to follow up on that, Vicki, how many of those get issued monthly? Well, that's what I'm looking for. I'm sorry to say I'm not finding it, but okay. I'm sure we could have it. I'll move on to uh, Councilmember Massey. Just very briefly, I just wanted to express my agreement with Ray um, that those monthly parking passes for city lots or parking structures also are rates that I think we should review um, and, and potentially also eligibility as well. Mr. Mayor. Yes. I did find it. Sorry. Um, for the monthly lot permit, that's the daytime permit. Uh, last year we sold um, 1,111 of them. And for the uh, 24 hour permit, uh, we sold 1,316. So they definitely are, are utilized and not something that people don't know about. All right. So it seems like the, uh, just based off the staff, staff recommendation, um, those emergency orders getting rescinded would be the priority and then the more comprehensive look at the parking rates uh, coming back at a future agenda item. If I see some nodding, looks like that would be the will of, of this council. And then I will kick off just very briefly. Uh, is there anything else on the parking permits or fines? Go ahead. Yeah, the only thing I'd say is that uh, they are, are ridiculously low. Ridiculous is probably a poor choice of words, but they are, they are too low. Um, I speak to many folks, the, the community service officers who who say that rates haven't been raised in forever and for many residents it's you know it's, it's a nuisance fine and there's no incentive oftentimes to move their vehicles for street sweeping um because it's only a 38 dollar fine or whatever that is so uh i think anything we do moving forward should include a, a rate increase okay um and then as far as the, the permit program, this is one question I want to get off, you know, right, right from the start is how many yellow meters do we have in town? Um, I apologize. I have that right here and it is uh, almost 1200. Okay. And sorry, Mary, I saw your hand up. Go ahead. All right, no, no worries, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, I I don't know if this is the right time to pro provide any questions regarding um, EV. Well, charging, or is that? Let's do that at the very up? end, just okay. kind of following the staff report and sure. presentation. So as far as parking permits, okay. I just wanted to ask the twelve hundred yellow posts. And then I'll look to my colleagues for any questions on the permits. I'm sure there's none. So we can move on to EV charging. I'm kidding. Who wants to kick it off? Yes, Councilmember Massey. Uh, Mr. Mayor, what's the what's the category we're addressing now? The residential parking permits. And then we can throw employee in there because it seems like staff group those together as well. Okay. Uh, on the last topic about uh, Citation rates, uh, I agree with Ray on that one as well, that we need to look at the rates. I think they're, you know, it's been a long time since they've been uh, reviewed and adjusted. So uh, for what that's worth. Um, so we're talking about the resident permit program and the fees. Okay, um, I'll keep it brief. Um, the rates are low. I said this the other night, you guys know this, so I won't harp on it. Um, my suggestion is if right now, I think if I'm understanding the category we're talking about right now, we're talking about the annual street parking permits that are $40 a permit. So we have at least one whole household or address that has 25 vehicles uh, at the address. 
and you can get both a sticker or you can get a hang tag, which can be used in various vehicles, including when you have guests come over. Um, my sense of it is that we should start by multiplying the rate a couple of times, probably three times, um, because when we talk about how valuable the real estate is in Hermosa Beach, how valuable our parking is in Hermosa Beach, uh, we're talking about some of the most valuable real estate in the world. Um, Forty dollars a year for a parking space um, means that they ultimately end up getting overutilized. If we were to charge $120 for the first parking permit, that's $10 a month for essentially unlimited parking in Hermosa Beach, which is still a screaming deal. Um, and then in order to incentivize folks to use their property to park their vehicles, um, it's my opinion that the second permit should be twice what the first one costs. The third permit should be twice what the second one costs. And three permits should be the limit for any particular address. So my instinct to begin would be your first parking permit costs $120. If you want a second one, that's $240 for the year. If you want a third one, that's $480 for the year. And then that's the limit that you can get. And if you want one of those to be a hang tag so you can exchange it among cars or use it for guests, you can do that. I would also say that if my inclination is we should decide at the time we adjust the rates uh, that there's an additional increase in a couple years from now um, to further adjust the rates to get somewhere approaching what the value of the benefit is to the public so that we make sure that those on-street parking spaces uh, are utilized by people who really need them and not overutilized by people uh, who don't really need them. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for that. Yes, Councilmember Mano. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I guess we'll start with um, the residential permits then. Uh, I, in general agreement with council member Massey, um, but some differences. So I think we should max out at three permits um, per household. I tend to think that you could keep the parking permit rates for the first one at 40 for this year, but establish that each year moving forward starting in 2023, there is a some percentage increase each year that residents can anticipate and expect. I think it should be 3%. You know, I'll let us debate that. And then they can get a second one. I think that should start at one, uh, 120. That can either be a second parking pass or it can be a guest pass. And then the third one can be your guest pass or your third pass, but then that doubles. So that would be 240. Um, and then that you max out, you get three. That list that was provided where, I don't know if it was it attached to the staff report that there's some households that have 29 permits. Who's doing that? I mean, is that a, I, and I, is that a multifamily property that I'm misinterpreting that, you know, there's 29 apartments and each one has one permit or is that really someone's house that has 29 permits that we've sold to? No, we, we accounted for the um, apartments because they're issued per unit. So they're included, but oh. we wouldn't, yeah, we wouldn't, we keep track of them individually. So that wouldn't be apartments. Is there any one house or one unit that has any of those higher number of permits? I mean, what is the abuse level at for those? Or did we not separate that out? So I don't think it's fair to lump in multifamily. Well, they're, they're just included and, and we count them the same way as we do the others. If there's a certain address with a particular unit and they have three, then we put them in the three category, right? With the rest of them. So that, that makes sense because they're, they're per unit, not per address. So someone has 29 permits. <clears throat> 
it's understand. in the actual I, like I'm so flabbergasted I was so hoping I had that wrong I am so flabbergasted like I Stacy not to interrupt I mean, but just clarification because I know you said that you looped in employee and residential that's not a business address right that is a residential address with 25 yes okay sorry Stacy <laughs> <laughs> I mean, talk about why we have a parking problem. Anyway, okay, so, and I do think we need to implement district-based residential parking. I think that that would help solve um, a lot of issues. I know that that will be complicated and a little time-consuming to develop, but I think it would be well worth the effort um, in the end. Um, but I think... The lowest hanging fruit is let's limit the number of passes. We have a parking problem in our coastal zone. Why? Maybe it's because there's a few people in town, more than a few, that are buying dozens of $40 passes and parking all over the street. So um, that needs that needs to change. So limiting the number of permits and then incrementally making them um, more expensive, I think is really important. I am not a fan of uh, big changes for that first permit, though. I, you know, we'll never be able to make any adjustments. We're going to upset too many people in this community, despite them understanding the value of parking on our streets um, being more than $40 for an entire year. Um, I think we need to just make those uh, much safer incremental changes that I think will have um, a great outcome um, as a result. So, and I'm, you know, I'm happy to hold my thoughts on the employee parking until after everyone speaks. Sure. Councilwoman yeah. Campbell. Totally flabbergasted. <laughs> I'm with you, Council Member Armato. Um, yeah, because they're not parking that many cars. So what are they doing? Making a profit selling them to people? Uh, and I, I just have a like a, a morbidly curious question about that. Does anybody remember why there was no limit? Or was it just an oversight? Or does anybody even remember? Because that's uh, crazy. <laughs> No memory. I know Suja doesn't remember because uh, she wasn't here. I, I don't know. And so somebody see uh, that was what you call a loophole, and and uh, I don't know how many took advantage of that. But um, so what I'll what I will add to what's been said already about residential parking permits is a couple things. Um, I'm very much in line with for for one. Please check me on this staff and and colleagues. Um, the requirements when you build a, a, a home, if I read it somewhere, you have to have two parking spaces and one guest parking space. And I know that the ADUs have changed a lot of that, but um, never unlimited. Um, and so why would we offer people to have more than three? I think the, the staff recommendation might have been four. Uh, if I saw that in the in the slide deck, but um, earlier today I was thinking, why would there ever be more than three or two, but three? And and I agree that they should not be priced the same. Um, three percent uh, is sounds like not even close to the value that has been, um, you know. Um, <laughs> unrealized over many, many, many years. And this is, I just want to point out for anybody listening, this is a complicated issue. So when it comes to residential permits, that's a very different consideration vis-a-vis -vis the Coastal Commission and access, because these, these are, it's not unimportant at all. It's just very different, right? So, um, and I know that there are still whatever number of, um, places in our city that that people live and own and rent that do not have two to three parking spaces and some don't have any. Um, I don't know if we know how many have none. I, I know I have an next door neighbor has none. 
or unless they park right kind of illegally on the sidewalk. Um, but I do think uh, I'm not, uh, I'm uncomfortable about springing a raise on this, this cycle because of the timeline, but I am comfortable with considering a much larger increase in the next cycle and beyond. Um, and I'll, I'll let my other, my colleagues weigh in. Thank you, Mr. Member. Thank you, Councilman Campbell. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, excellent report, staff. Thank you very much for the, the level of detail that you provided. And, uh, you know, the, the numbers are staggering with the, the thousand plus residents that have five or more vehicles registered to park on our streets, on public space, at what amounts to 11 cents a day, because that's what 40 divided by, divided by 365 is. So um, I understand your, your point, Justin, in terms of $128 is still a smoking deal, because that equates to 33 cents a day to take up a public parking space uh, that is being subsidized by taxpayers. That's a parking space that's not generating its uh, intended revenue. It's providing many of us, and uh, present company included, I'll speak for myself, the opportunity to expand my square footage at, the, at my house and not park on the public street. You know, many of us have decided to change our garages into gyms and offices. And I, and I guess staff, we don't, we don't really have a way of knowing how many parking spaces slash garage spaces each resident has, do we? That's sort of a bridge too far. Out of the 300 and, or excuse me, 3,815 addresses that have residential permits, there's no way for us to really ascertain outside of looking at each individual address specifically to see how many parking spaces slash garage spaces that address has. Is that correct? Yeah, that, that's correct. Okay. I mean, unless we devote a lot of staff resources to doing that kind of work. Right. And, um, and, and maybe that's a, a long-term project, but in theory, the majority of our residents are supposed to have parking. Now, I understand some of that parking was designed for a Model T and not the big suburban SUV that we now drive or the Honda Odyssey or Toyota. But in theory, more places have parking than don't. Is that a safe assumption on my part? Yes, I think so. Okay. And then... And there's no requirement that the city provide subsidized parking for residents, is there? This is a nice to have, not a must have? Yeah, that's a correct statement. Okay. Um, and if I have, so right now if I have an EV, I don't have to pay to register that EV or excuse me, non-combustible engine. It could be a hydro cell or whatever. If I have a non-combustible engine, I don't have to pay for my residential parking permit. Is that correct? The electric vehicles don't pay. Right, okay. <clears throat> and electric vehicles also don't have to pay to park. So that's so I get a parking permit for my electric vehicle, and I can also park in a two or three hour metered parking space with my electric vehicle. Is that correct? Yes, if you have the residential, you can park at the yellow meters, and if you, you can pay, park free at the silver meters. Okay, so essentially if I have an, an EV and a residential parking sticker, I can park anywhere in the city that I want to. Does that include the lots, Peter? I'm assuming it may. Uh, no, actually the lots uh, require everyone to pay. All vehicles okay. entering to pay. So just on the street. Okay, so all, all street metered parking then is free. 
Okay. And if I live on the south end of town and park in front of my street with a metered spot, with my, excuse me, my parking permit, I can park anywhere in the city with a yellow pole. That's a 24-hour metered spot, right? Right. Okay. So I, I know there's been some discussion about zones, and I, I certainly think a district-based residential parking zone is, is something we need to look at. You know, I don't know if it's what the right configuration is, maybe a one, two, and three, one being a southern zone from Hirondo through 10th, or maybe then the business zone from 10 to 14, and then a northern zone from 14 to 27th, or, or something like that. Um, I don't know what the right zones are, but it, if the intent of the parking permit program is so that I can park my car on the street because I can't park in my driveway or garage, then I should be limited to park in my zone close to my house as opposed to being able to drive anywhere and park anywhere I want to because I have the, the privilege of having a residential parking permit. So I, I can certainly see the residential parking zone as a, you know, something we can look at in the, in the near future, uh, probably a bridge too far. But I, I think that's something we definitely should look at because, you know, and, I, and I'm speaking from experience. I'm one of the guys that has one of those residential parking permits and I happen to have an EV. So I am lucky I can park for free and I can charge for free. And uh, I'm not certain that's the, the right thing that we need right now for our city. Um, and uh, let's see if I have any other questions. I think that was all I had for residential parking permits. Mr. Mayor, thank you, sir. Thank you. I'm going through my questions to see which was answered already. Um, no one's talked about the out-of-state vehicles. Um, I know that Vicki, in your report, you said that they're registered to their address. Their address on their license is in Hermosa Beach, but somehow their license plate, the vehicle's registered out-of-state. Uh, I believe the only exception for that would be active duty military. So, um, and then also in the report that there was a hundred and I forget the exact number, 187 vehicles without a state. 183 or something, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Okay. So where's the discrepancy there? Uh, most. Oh. Yeah, I think um, I believe they're not sure if there's a resolution that allows that they don't have to register right away, but the next, if they come back to buy a permit, they do okay. have to have their car re-registered. They have to approve all their other um, occupancy and, you know, residential leases and stuff, but. Okay. Um, question for Ken. Would Coastal Commission need to approve any changes to this residential past program, fee increases, capping the limit for passes? Um, it's very clear in the permit language that any changes in the um, uh, fees are subject to their amendment of that permit. Okay. Um, and it, it goes back to some of our previous discussions. I think everything we're speaking of would be in the correct direction, but they they hold dear to the language in their permit. So it just, it means we'd have to go through that step before we could implement them. Okay. And this clarification on the permits for employees, do they get the actual window sticker or are they the transferable tags or whatever the employer would like? Sorry, was that the question about the what the employee employee buy? passes? Do they actually get the sticker for their vehicle? The or sticker. They, okay. Yeah, the sticker. Sorry, I didn't hear. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, just based on basic supply and demand that there's 1,200 yellow metered 
parking meters in our city, and then we're selling 9,677 um, parking permits. It's, it's kind of out of alignment there. So um, I'm definitely in favor with bringing up the rates. I think this year, um, knowing that Coastal is probably going to have to sign off on it, I would be more inclined to have the increases go in in 2023. As far as the, the cap per household, uh, what was staff's thought on the four versus three? Any logic or thought behind that? Or is that kind of where it dropped off? I'm sorry, I'm just pulling up the... the um, yeah, and just to, all I can speak to is that the recommendation are in the study was capping it at four. Okay. Um, and their, their price recommendations were a little more incremental in some comparisons they did. It's not easy to find total like for like comparisons, but they did base it on amounts they found in some other coastal cities. Okay. That would be all of my questions for now. I'll kick it over to Council Member Campbell. Uh, to weigh in on this question, I mean, I don't know why they recommended four, and my curiosity is whether they went there because of how unbound it was. Um, I, I, I don't personally, unless somebody can bring forward an example or two of why we should consider more than three, that I would be interested in that. I, I, I can't come up with anything in my mind. Mr. Yeah, just adding up the residents of four or more is 590, and then three or more is 1379, if my math is correct. Councilmember Massey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just quickly wanted to note that I also support considering a district based parking permit system. Thank you, and I'll have my support for that as well. Uh, do you want to touch on, I know that we'll be having this discussion for the, the later item as well, so I don't want to necessarily beat the dead horse right now on, on the intricacies of the residential parking permit. Um, do you want to touch on the employee parking permit if there's any questions for staff? Could I go back to? Oh, sure, you have one more. Sorry, I, could I go back to residential? Mr. Yes, Mayor, go ahead. Going to employee. Um, based on a couple of your questions. Can, is there, can we gauge Coastal Commission now? You know, just sort of feel them out, so that, you know, here's what we are considering as a city um, in terms of potentially raising our metered rates and we're looking at our, our uh, residential parking permit rates and see what they, what their requirements will be. I mean, because at the end of the day, if we if we end up increasing access for parking for non residential parking, that is certainly a win for visitors and in ex by extension, the Coastal Commission. Um, you know, and it, it relates to the uh, great question Council Member Campbell had and Suja's response. Um, Asking them open-ended questions sometimes doesn't get us anywhere, but if we have direction from council as to a direction, I mean, just generally where you want to go, which I've, I've heard some consensus, it sounds like, I think we would, you know, make that proposal to coastal staff. The timing is good because we have a pending um, LUP amendment application and then rel relative related to our mobility policies. So, um, so yeah, I guess the answer to your question is generally yes, but I think it would be better if it was had some sense of where uh, the city was and some, you know, even some uh, authorization that the council feels a certain way. Okay. So, we're, okay. yeah. Okay. Um, and, and just to add to your point, Mr. Mayor, um, you know, our residential parking permits should be for Hermosa Beach residents only. And if your vehicle is not registered in California 
And my understanding is, and the city attorney can correct me if I'm wrong, you are required to register your vehicle within 20 days of declaring residency or intending to reside in, in California. And uh, so by extension, you cannot be a Hermosa Beach resident if you're not even a California resident, with the exception of those active duty military here on gov official government orders. That's the only exception that I'm familiar with. And the city attorney can correct me if I'm wrong. So I, I don't believe we should issue any parking permits, period, to non-California registered vehicles. Outside of the exception. I may, I, I'm just speculating here, but I, I got a note that suggests that, you know, we do have a lot of residents that have multiple residents so they may have residency in Hermosa as a first home and somewhere else a second home or vice versa I mean that's the kind of community we are so their cars may very well be registered in another state oh I so I, I understand just that just to think something to think about but anyway. no, I I get it <laughs> and you know there I see Iowa plates and West Virginia plates every single day and these folks have been here longer than I've been here um for whatever reason and, uh, but if you're not a resident, you know, it's a Hermosa Beach resident program. And by extension, in my opinion, you can't be a Hermosa Beach resident unless you are a resident of California. And if you declare residency in another state and therefore register your vehicle in another state, then I would not support your ability to, to get a government, uh, or a Hermosa Beach subsidized parking permit if you're not even a resident of the state of California. Thank you for that, Ray. Employee parking. Staff recommendation is gonna to be to update location for employee parking permit to, um, as I discussed, maybe top levels of the parking structure. Um, thoughts on that? Questions for staff and any other portion of the program? Councilmember Massey. Yeah, very quickly. I just wanted to express agreement with Ray on the last point. Um, you have to have your car registered in California in order to get a parking permit from our city. That should be the rule because I've seen the same thing as, as Ray. The rule is when you establish residency, you require to register your vehicle here. So you're paying your fair share of the cost of maintaining our roads in our city and on our highways and everything else. And lots of people aren't doing that. So they should have to do that in order to get a permit from the city. With respect to employee parking, um, I'm supportive of limiting employee parking to the upper deck on lot C, um, provided it's a flexible program that if the upper deck is completely full, then employees can park down on the next deck and the next deck. But um, somehow we have to have employee permits only work at parking that is um, not prime parking for patrons of our businesses. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for that, Justin. And then just a question for staff, those parking structure permits, do you see a lot of employees or employers purchasing those for their staff in the restaurants downtown so they can have their employees' vehicles close to the place of business? Is that we believe that there We believe that there are a lot of employees that buy those lot permits, if that was the question. Yes. We don't require them to show that they're an employee because that's not one of the requirements, but yes, there are employees that do that. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Mayor Pertem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so if an, if an employee who works at, say, Mickey's purchases a parking permit, their parking is the yellow metered poles and not the two or three hour meeting meter parking spots. Is that correct, Vicki or Ken? You're muted, Vicki. I'm muted, Vicki. Sorry, um, they could do either. Oh, so they can park in a two or three hour metered. So can an employee park in a two or three hour metered spot or a 24 hour metered spot? 
No, if you if the employee buys the residential parking permit for yellow meters, then they park at the yellow meters. If they buy the lot permit, then they have to buy, then they have to park in the lot or the structure. The lot or the structure, but not one of the two or three hour metered spots then, right? So it's either the lots, no. the structure, or 24 hour meter spot. Yes. Okay. So and they pay differently, they pay differently, excuse me, I'm sorry. They pay differently if they purchase the 24 hour. Uh -huh. There's two different rates, right? There's $31 and $64 for $62 for that. Right. And the yellow metered spot gives them the same parking privileges that a resident would get. They can park on the north side, south side, or anywhere there's a yellow parking meter. Right? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. um, would it be prudent to, again, I'm looking at lots A and B as our most lucrative parking lots. And in my mind, we shouldn't have residents or employees parking there as those should be geared towards our visitors who are looking to go buy a sweatshirt at Spiders or run into the lighthouse or go get a beer or whatever. Um, in, in my mind, it would make sense to limit until we can get the zones, I mean, I think eventually we want employee parking zones similar to a residential parking zone. Zone one would be the southern end, zone two would be the business end, and zone three, the or the commercial end in, the, in zone two, and then zone three, the northern end, or whatever the numbers are, but something similar to that. So that you are limited to park where you work. Um, and in my mind, to to glom on to what Justin said, I mean, I, I think it would be prudent that employees have a separate parking sticker that requires them to park on either the top two floors of the underutilized parking structure or one of the 24-hour meter spots and not any of the lots. Because then in addition to that, we have folks that park at the community center, on Valley, on Ardmore, Clark Building, Hirondo, and everywhere else. So there's a, there's certainly a considerable number of free spots. Um, and if we limit employees to the yellow parking meters and the upper two floors of the underutilized parking structure, um, that should be sufficient parking for our employees. Is that a safe assumption in my mind? Uh, safe assumption? I'm not sure I know the answer to that. <laughs> I mean, I, I, you know, I go to my parking lot B and I go by there at 11 o'clock and it's filled with employees. Or parking lot A and it's filled with employees. So part of the problem is you get somebody who wants to visit, they look for parking, uh, as previously mentioned, down in the in the heart of the commercial zone, and they can't park because we have employees parking there, or we have over a thousand residents that can also park, purchase those lot or structured parking meters. And again, I, I don't see why we are doing that um, to the detriment of visitors. So I. I in my mind, it would make sense to limit where employees can park and to have them under a separate parking program that's different from the residential parking permit with the long-term goal, similar to the residential parking zone, would be to have a, a business parking zone and maybe a slight uh, increase as well. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, and Councilmember Jackson, I, I think um, we're we're taking all of Councilmember's comments uh, in our notes, and what you are sharing is not un, unheard of. There are downtowns in cities where they determine that that they would like customers to be able to have first first dibs at. The closest parking to the commercial area, and I think that's um, that's not unreasonable. And and if those are taken up by 
folks who are not eating, dining, shopping, then, then that makes it difficult for the commercial area. I guess one piece of information, I don't know if it's helpful or not. I mean, there are, um, for the residential area, permits there there were 183 there's that's usually around the same number the year before it was 265 so that's potentially of course you don't the thing is that you don't know how many are parking in the lot that's those are the ones that are on the street but how many fit on the top do you happen to know um peter how many spaces are on the top i mean i think it's 300 overall in the structure right that's that's correct, Vicki. Um, I don't know how many are in the top two floors. Um, uh, right. Um, on any given day um, outside of the pandemic, um, I would say that uh, the number of permits in the three lots would probably exceed the parking capacity on the top two floors there. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Anything else? That's all for now, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Thank you, sir. Any other questions? Councilmember Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I would just say I think it's perfectly appropriate to to suggest that we might think about where we um, identify places where employees who are not residents, who are employees of businesses, park. I don't think we should make it. Um, you know, I know that at a lot of times of the year, the structure is not full. So, but segmenting it to the top two floors makes sense. I don't know if there's a seasonal component to that, but um, I live near a strip on, on Valley of 12 hour free public parking. And I see a lot of employees parking there or in, in the city hall parking lot and walking to work. Um, that's not ideal in the busy times of year. And I don't think it's unreasonable to think through um, how to optimize what we have in terms of public parking capacity um, in the spirit of access to visit the coastal zones. Um, and, uh, and, and lastly, it occurs to me that the um, untapped shared parking arrangements could Phil, I, I, maybe it's been brought up before with regard to employee parking, but some of those uh, programs that have yet to be realized where we have sort of completely dormant parking where there might be like a school parking lot that could be advantaged by uh, a little bit of revenue and, um, you know, really eliminate you know, people who are coming to work for several hours on busy nights parking in um, free parking, um, free public parking. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Anyone else? Councilwoman Armada. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just generally, I think we should increase the rates, um, look to staff for guidance on that, and then uh, limit where employee parking can be. So if that's the two top floors of the parking structure, great. If it's that plus maybe other designated areas in town, I kind of leave staff up to um, advising us on the best places for that. But I definitely think there needs to be designated spots for employees to park. That's it. Perfect. Any last thoughts on employee parking permits? All right. We'll move on to the EV. Do you want to kick off the electric vehicle or zero emissions vehicle segment? Councilwoman Campbell. Yeah, I mean, what I'll say generally, I think it's come up in conversations before, but um, <laughs> I'll say as someone who owns an EV, I, I have always fed the meter. <laughs> I didn't even know until I got on council that I could park for free. Um, that said, I think the incentive aspect of offering free parking for those uh, with electric vehicles has subsided um, in its need. Um, and we can look at the, the um, we call it the, the carpool lanes in all of the region, 
how they sort of have phased those out. Uh, you don't automatically get that benefit that that was once offered um, for owning an electric vehicle. I, so I think that trend, I, I think we should be charging for those spots. Um, I do not think that those who are charging in those spots currently are necessarily um, doing it out of reason for incentive to be in the EV market. And um, I would, you know, leave the rates to uh, good recommendations based on good information. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for that. Mayor Portem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, certainly agree with, uh, with Mary. You know, the, I, I believe the future is electric and I applaud those visionaries of our great city who had the, who realized early in, early on that we needed to create incentives to promote EVs, reduce the negative impact and whatnot. Um, but I think it's time to charge for parking and to charge for charging. Uh, the, the days of freebies and incentives, I think, are gone. Um, we do not encourage turnover as our charging is currently configured. Um, it's supposed to be maxed at two hours, but there are cars, you know, that understand that our community service officers can't be all places at all times and who will leave their chargers, leave their vehicles parked overnight. Uh, so you wake up in the middle of the night or you go early in the morning to charge and there's that car that's uh, stopped charging three hours ago that's still taking up a, a parking spot. So I think we need to uh, figure out what the best manner is to charge for the charging, if that's the direction we go. Uh, but we, we must ensure that whatever we do, we encourage turnover so that it's capped at two hours and that other folks have an opportunity to charge who want to charge. Um, I believe in the staff report, if I'm not mistaken, we are spending somewhere around $70,000 we're giving away $70,000 a year in vehicle charging. Was that correct? Did I read that right somewhere, Peter? Yes, that's the estimated electric. Oh, Doug, thank you, Doug. Okay, yeah. and then we have to pay to install and then to maintain those chargers. And that's yes. what, $3,000 roughly to install per and then any idea of what it costs per annum to, to maintain? It's hard to put a real number on that. We have a handful of, of different installations that have been done in different times in the past. And they all, almost all have a different vendor, a different agreement. Um, it's it's hard to, to estimate that. That $3,000 is just, you know, per our um, installation last year. That's how much just one charger costs. One charger. And is but there the maintenance okay. and everything else is, is, is included. Different. And is there are the charges that we currently have configured to provide free charging only, or could it be switched, <laughs> changed so that in order to charge you had to pay? Most of them are yeah, most of them are networked in a way that we could uh, begin, you know, we could implement a charge, um, but we would have to look at them again because of the vintage and the different agreements. Right. Maybe not all of them. Yeah. Okay. Because right now I can charge for as long as I need to charge and I can park for as long as I need to park all free on the government dime. And, um, and we have, so the parking, the charges on the top of the parking structure, you have to pay to park and you have to pay to charge. Is that correct? Not for all of them. For the, the rapid chargers, the level three, those there is a charge for the electricity. All of them you have to pay to park. If I and is that correct, Peter? Yeah. And all I, all in the parking structure. Exactly. And there are how many on top? I, I don't is that four? No, there's more than four. Um, I would have to double check. It's I want to say eight, but there's there's a handful of. Okay, so you sure. have to pay to park and pay to charge for those four. 
No, only at no, only at the rapid. So okay, out of that, I'm sorry, that's right. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Not all the rapid. All of them are the, okay, right. and so the rest of the ones that are throughout the city are not rapid chargers, and those are all free. Exactly. Okay, and the two that sit in front of City Hall, those are pay charger state charging stations. Is that correct? No. No, those are free as well. The two that sit in front of, excuse me, the two that sit in front of City Hall, the two black ones, those are free. Yes, yeah, you have to subscribe to the the vendor's software mm -hmm. to charge, but it, it's free. Okay, I'm ninety nine percent sure on that, but I can get back to you. Okay, I, I remember years ago, and and this was years ago when we first had our our plugin, I went there and it required some, maybe I just didn't know what I was doing, which isn't surprising. Um, but okay, so all our chargers outside of the ones in the parking structure are free. Got it, okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for that. Any other thoughts? Yes, Councilwoman Romano. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm open to uh, charging for parking um, for electric vehicles. Um, I think it's a nice perk that we offer free charging, you know, so if we're going to offer free charging, then pay for parking and or vice versa. Um, but, you know, as far as we think we've come with electric vehicles, we have further to go. We can continue to provide some kind of an incentive over our neighboring cities. Um, and that could be one. I don't think it comes at a huge cost. Um, if it's $70,000 the, to the city, uh, cost to the city, uh, that's not enough for me to, to worry about. Um, but we could be benefiting. Instead, we're, you know, it's a double hit. It's we're paying for the electricity and we're also not receiving the parking revenue. So at least um, get back our parking revenue and uh, I'm fine not charging for uh, charging for electric charging. That's it. Thank you for that. Yes, Councilmember Massey. I generally agree with Stacy. Um, you know, I don't stay up late at night worrying about the cost to the city for providing the electricity to charge EVs. Um, so if we're going to look at the rates, my inclination, you know, if folks feel strongly, if the will of council is strongly that <coughs> EV drivers should <coughs> pay their fair share, then that's fine with me too. Excuse me. But I would just say that if we're going to institute some kind of fee to try to offset the costs or recoup fully the costs, the fee should certainly be designed to try to encourage turnover at those spots, both for patronage of businesses and also for making sure that the spots are available for folks to charge. Um, ultimately, I think with the development of electric vehicles that uh, with the increasingly long range, um, it, there's less of a need for folks to have charging stations available when they go, you know, especially regional visitors when they go to Hermosa and back home. Um, but nonetheless, I agree with Stacey, it is a nice perk. I think it sets us apart. Um, and it's something that I think folks notice. And, you know, folks who drive these vehicles typically are folks with disposable income or the type of folks that we want patronizing our businesses. So um, those are my thoughts. Thanks, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, just basic thoughts. I don't know if anyone's touched on the EV vehicles getting the free residential parking permits. Um, that's something I'd like to see revisited. Um, I don't necessarily agree that EV vehicles, which again, if they have a garage, they should probably have a charger in the garage and they should probably be using their, their private property for it. That being said, I also understand that um, someone may have an EV that lives in an apartment, but um, I still think that they should be paying for a residential parking permit. Um, as far as charging, um, one of my questions was, would we need to change if we decided to charge um, for charging in the free, currently free locations, or um, I, I think we either need to have them charge for parking or charge for charging, um, but one of those needs to change. I think both 
getting a free boat um, or free, you know, free charging and free parking. Um, I think adoption is getting there, and I think the more and more EV vehicles that get produced. Um, someone mentioned the carpool lanes, and when I drive home, I'm like in the carpool lane with my HOV stickers. I mean, most of the cars are zero emission vehicles, so um, those days are slowly dwindling for that that perk of an EV. And uh, I, I am definitely interested in the conversation of whether to charge for parking or charge for charging. Um, those are kind of my two thoughts on those. So any other last thoughts for electric vehicles? Yes, Council Member Campbell. Uh, just one, um, I, I, I kind of uh, was liking what my colleague, Council Member Massey was saying about you know, you could go either way. Um, I agree that charging for charging is, I think it's appropriate. I would also want it to be priced fairly. But when I think of um, what the incentive, just to to pat, pat a, a, a climate conscious auto buyer on the back for free charging, um, I think we can look at this in different ways. So for example, every year, or we have in many years in a row, debated whether or not we should offer free parking over the holidays to fuel, you know, kind of the, the holiday season and, and the local economy. And, um, you know, charging for charging could just cover that and more. Um, and I, I guess, you know, I, I could be overstating it, but what you look at the auto industry and they're moving quickly now, swiftly to becoming all all electric fleets in, in the near term, nearer term. Um, I think that that to look at where the value could be placed, um, I don't think a, a people feel it unfair or unduly fair or, or inhibiting to invest in an electric vehicle to rely on uh, absolutely free charging. Um, that's and that's just what I wanted to add is is maybe to look at you know that savings for a fair you know charge um, to be um, an asset become an asset that could be allocated to another need that we also have as a city. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I might have missed some of them in my notes, but electric vehicles, I read in the staff report that the CSOs have a hard time when they're driving around knowing which vehicles are zero emissions if they don't have a CAV vehicle on it or CAV decal on it. So is that something that we want to keep as a perk for the silver meter posts? Is that correct? Yes, uh, Mayor, the community services officers are having an increasingly difficult time making the distinction as uh, automakers move towards their streamlining their fleets and their electric vehicles look more and more like every other vehicle that's on the road um, and don't have necessarily manufacturer decals on them that would indicate as such. Um, and they are, of course, able to park at those silver post meters. Okay. Um, that's another... Th Topic I'd like to see where the council wills at. Um, as I said, I think adoption is there, especially in California, that we're moving towards a cleaner and cleaner fleet. Um, I am like Councilwoman Campbell that I didn't know that that was a perk of a zero emissions vehicle until I got in council and this came up in 2019. Um, and then I still, when I pull into lots or pull into a parking spot, I forget if it's a yellow or silver that zero emission vehicles don't have to pay. So I just end up paying anyways. So, um, I would like to see where the will is, if that's something that the council wants to revisit, if that's a policy they want to keep. Any thoughts on that? Mr. Mayor, are you asking if we think EV cars should pay parking meters? For the silver meter that they currently don't have to pay. Yeah, and sorry, my comments weren't clear. I didn't mean just the commercial zone. I think everywhere in town. Okay. Feel free parking. Perfect. Is that enough for staff? Mayor Portem? 
Uh, I, I agree. Uh, no free parking residential, no free parking lots, no free parking structure, no free parking two and three hour meters. And again, uh, I, I think there should be no free charging to you know, 70 to 100 grand or whatever we're spending as a city because um, it does not encourage turnover what we currently have. You go by Valley Park any given day and there are cars that are parked there all day and all night. You go along the wall down by City Hall and there are cars that are parked there all day and all night. Um, you go down to the one by 2nd Street, you go on the ones on Pier Avenue. And folks understand when the CSO's officers are there and when they're not there. And uh, you know, again, I'm, I'm a guy with two EVs. So <laughs> I'm speaking from personal experience and I get up at strange hours of the night and I go, man, this guy's car has obviously been parked here all night because it stopped charging three hours ago. And then I drive by at seven in the morning and the bloody car is still there. So these guys know when the CSOs are there and you can't, we can't rely on the CSOs uh, to Peter's point to try to figure out what's, what's a, the right car, what isn't the right car. And you know, I, I just don't think we have the luxury. It's a nice to have and, and believe me, it's a great perk. I love being able to park for free. I love being able to charge for free, but we're a city with limited parking and limited resources. And, uh, you know, I think you got to pay to play. So I think that's certainly, certainly something we should revisit, Mr. Mayor. Perfect. We'll look for that to come back in the future. Uh, looking at staff, is there anything else, um, any other direction that you would need for the discussion tonight or? You feel like all the discussion has been had. I think it was pretty comprehensive, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments from my colleagues? Last chance. Yes, Councilwoman Campbell. I just want to say, and it's still a screaming deal. There's a rest at that. Anything else? All right. Well, Madam City Clerk. We have one speaker in the audience that would like to address this, Mr. Higgins. And for everyone online, this would be the time for public participation, the second time during the study session. So raise your virtual hand. Welcome back, Tony. Hi. Um, do I got to pick this up? There. Okay, um, just a, a couple of general comments. It sure would be nice if the uh, council members would submit their questions in advance to the city so that the city could be prepared to answer them and we wouldn't have all this back and forth. Um, I want to remind the council that many residents uh, already pay outrageously high property taxes. And what is that fund? 40% of the city budget? I don't know. I, I, it's, it's probably something in that, in that neighborhood. The idea of freebies, okay, it's ridiculous. You're getting 40% of your budget already from property taxes. There, there, there has to be a little bit of a consideration of that. Now, the common theme, and it really bothers me that, 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 that I hear over and over again, is that a good deal for residents like low um, 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 parking permit fees it's somehow a bad idea. It's something that needs to be squeezed. And, you know, at the same time, we're, we're gifting, what, a million dollars by the end of this physical year, a uh, fiscal year to the, the, the business community in terms of encroachment fees and lost parking revenue, but let's squeeze the residents. Let's squeeze them. Everything we can. That, that, that's, you know, it, it, there's something wrong with that. And I don't think you're giving enough consideration to that. Um, 
A good deal for the residents is not a bad deal for the city, especially with, with your, your revenues from property taxes and everything else is so high. I, I also have a suggestion. You know, you want to grow downtown. And you have parking lots A, B, and C right in the downtown um, um, area. Why not move those parking lots at some point to Pier Avenue up above um, um, Manhattan and open up those areas for shops and for rooftop dining? Um, I, I, I think you got the wrong vision when you close down the only truck route, okay, in and out of the city, um, a major commuter route, you want to grow business, grow it west of Hermosa Avenue. Not, you know, uh, and don't shove all that commercial traffic and commuter traffic into the residential neighborhoods. I'm sorry, I, I exceeded my time. Thank you, Tony. Madam City Clerk. The next is Ken Allen, who will want me to promote him, so just one second. Welcome, Mr. Allen. Tell me when the camera's on. It's not on yet, sir. There it is. No, no, just let me know when it's on. You're on. Okay, great. Thank, thanks. Um, so, uh, I saw some online chatter from uh, Jackson, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Jackson. He was chattering at something about the parking permits, and there was some uh, there was some discussion about whether the the uh, image was uh, sexist or not. I, I really don't give a crap either way. <clears throat> what I do give a crap about is, is that why are rich people, and I think you guys are discussing this a little bit, why are rich people that live in three and four and five million dollar houses getting, uh, who, who get government subsidized um, electric vehicles, why are they not paying their fair share I mean, you got you got a guy like say Dempsey Nelson, for example, who lives probably in a four four and a half million dollar house. He gets a house, he gets a car from that's paid partly by the government with this thing. Why should he get to? Why are we subsidizing subsidizing rich people for their parking? It just makes no sense to me, and I think we're all on the same page there. And um, so I just you know like you. you uh, I will also tell you that uh, I have a choice to make when I go out to my, I had a contractor call me up the other day. He goes, hey, Ken, let's go to lunch. Uh, I'll buy you lunch anywhere you want. And uh, I said, you know what? I said, I'll meet you in El Segunda, Hana Sushi, 409 Main Street. Why would I go down to Hermosa Beach when it costs like a crap load of money to park and you're, you're in fear of getting a ticket? I can go over to El Segundo have a nice lunch. I'm not in any particular rush. There's loads of nice restaurants over there. Two great sushi places. Why would why would I go to Hermosa Beach and be under pressure when I can go over there and, and kind of park for free? There's no parking. Why, why is it that, I mean, I don't care too much about the south end of town. You guys on the south end of uh, town, you know, that's a different world of Hermosa. <clears throat> But we're, nobody's going down there. But why? Why are we? Why are you not allowing? If we, if you're going to give out parking passes, why would a guy like me up on the east end of town, which I'm very happy to be in the east end of town, I don't want to be down on the west end. Why? Why? Why do I have to pay for parking? Anyways, I think you guys. Uh, hopefully, you'll get on the right track. And Mary, love your giggles. You can't. You can't. You can't get through a sentence without giggling. I think it's the funniest thing. It's so cute. I love it. Keep it up. Talk to you later. Madam City Clerk. Okay, the next one is David 
Grayson, just one second, let me unmute you, sir. Welcome, Commissioner. Okay, I'm unmuted now. Um, yeah, good evening. Uh, I just wanted to make a sort of technical comment based on some of the discussion about the residential uh, permit program. Um, it wasn't clear from some of the discussion that all of the council members were really acknowledging or perhaps even aware that for the residential permits, it's not just a matter of being able to pull a park at a yellow post meter. Um, a big benefit is that uh, up on a lot of the unmetered streets, like on Manhattan, for example, there's a whole bunch of residential spots um, that have uh, hour limitations or a few hour limitations. And so you can park there overnight or for several hours at a time. So for example, if you're talking about comparing the number of yellow post meters to the number of, of, of permits, that's not quite a good comparison because you need to factor in and understand how many of those additional spaces are available in the non-metered um, and so that you might ask uh, for some met metrics on how many spaces are there. And what I don't know, but might also be pertinent is for the, uh, the uh, employee program. I don't know if that also entitles them to park uh, to exceed the limitation on the non metered spaces. So just wanted to highlight that for everybody. So we're all looking at uh, things from, you know, uh, properly and, and uh, commonly. Thank you. Okay, the next person is Jonathan Wicks. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, sir, yes. go ahead. Thank you and, and thank you to staff and, and council for uh, trying to finally tackle this really important issue that our community faces. Uh, thank you for the conversation tonight. Um, just want to direct uh, staff and council's attention to the existing municipal code and law that exists already within our community. Uh, that's code section 17.44 regarding uh, residential minimum parking requirements uh, and the general parking session section, but specifically section 17.44.050, unlawful to reduce available parking. You know, existing law in Hermosa Beach says that a parking garage for a single family home is to be used for vehicle storage. So the members of our community who are not able to park a car in their garage currently because that's been converted for office or gym or rec room or whatever, those, those homes are actually in violation of the law as it stands currently. So I would ask council to direct staff to enforce the existing law that is currently on the books in our city. And if that law is a burden or is troublesome, then perhaps we should reduce the minimum parking requirements in our community, especially with the goal of meeting our RENA goals for housing and trying to find ways to uh, you know, build housing in this community, which is much needed. Uh, and I think many uh, people understand that, you know, we've done a great job increasing residential property values in this city. Commercial property values have struggled to rise uh, in a conjunction with our neighbors to the north and south and east of us. And I would just uh, finally like to say that I wholeheartedly support the increase in any monthly or hourly parking rates that we're charging to guests and residents, and that there are ways that those policies can be put in place to benefit the community, especially through a parking benefits district where parking revenues don't go to the general fund, but specifically are made to make improvements on those block faces, commercial or residential, where the revenues are being collected. And then finally, I would like to ask the city manager, Sue Jalowenthal, to comment if she has time on the overnight residential community parking program she started in Long Beach. And I believe 
there's a lot of similarity to our community. And I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you very much for your hard work. And I appreciate seeing the results. The Great. next person is Densi Nelson. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, uh, City Clerk, uh, Mr. Mayor, Council, staff. Uh, boy, I could talk for hours about parking and incentives. Um, but let me say at the outset, you are very brave to take this on. I don't think any of you are on Council when the last time park, raising parking fees was on the agenda. That place was packed with people in the lobby with pitchforks and torches because they were so angry about the raising of fees. Having said that, at that time and now, I totally agree that it's high time that all of these uh, permits and fees be raised, including those for electric vehicles. Um, I know more about the electric vehicle incentive program and community in Hermosa Beach than anybody in town. I can safely say that. My car in 2002 was the car that they took the picture of the sticker, the HOV sticker, so that the parking enforcement could recognize clean fuel vehicles even though it wasn't just limited to electric vehicles. But at the time, and certainly three years later, when we formed Plug in America, our position was we were always prepared to pay for the fuel we got from those electric vehicles. That was not what this was about, certainly not for those of us that already owned electric vehicles. The idea was it was another arrow in the quiver to encourage folks to try these electric vehicles, knowing full well that the cars themselves would sell themselves once folks got them in them. The HOV lanes, the free parking, the free charging was all to just load up the ideas that, well, maybe I should try one of these cars. It was never intended for those of us that had them. As I've said with my rooftop solar or anything, I never intended return of investment in my lifetime, let alone within a few years. It's about what we need to do to do the right thing. And I, I am so proud of the city of Hermosa Beach. We are a leader. We are ones that recognize that. We offer these incentives because we knew this was the right thing. Not, not for any profit, not for any of us that can afford to do it. It was to incentivize us to encourage others to get into these cars. I fully support. We Now that that is, it's not fully there, but I think everyone can see by the number of electric vehicles we have around town, and around the state and in certain parts of the nation, folks have recognized these are great cars. We don't need those incentives. We are willing to pay our fair share and we always were. So go ahead, increase those permits. We need to do it. And I'm very upset about the people who abuse the privilege and then do occupy those spaces so that uh, folks who would be coming and shopping, dining, aren't coming and getting that privilege. Those spaces should be available for people who are coming on to charge their cars and shop and dine in Hermosa, not for and to get some free ride. That's not what this is about. So uh, please go ahead. I recognize staff's uh, recommendation, take it. And the only exception should be, think about seniors and folks on low on fixed incomes. There are some of those in our community. You haven't talked about that at all. People on fixed incomes and uh, uh, seniors who uh, might, Maybe that's where you should go rather than district. Think about folks on fixed income. I could talk for another six hours on this, but I'm done. Thanks, folks. Good night. Thank you for your hard work. Bye. The last speaker that I have raising their hand is Matt McCool. So if you would like to speak, please raise your virtual hand. Hold on. Go ahead, Matt. Thank you, Madam City Clerk. Uh, good evening, City Council, staff, Matt McCool. Uh, two points I want to make is first, and I had some people contact me today about this, and I told them I'd call in, is that uh, the year 2022 cannot be touched. Uh, the idea of going ahead and charging three times the rate within a month's notice of when those parking permits come out is absolutely ridiculous. It's a crazy idea. I agree with Councilmember Massey that yes, the price needs to go up, but I also agree with uh, Councilmember Armato that it has to be done incrementally, but 2022 has to be off the table. You're gonna go ahead and put out to people that, hey, you know what? They're expecting $40 and then all of a sudden it's you're gonna pay $120, absolutely ridiculous. Uh, second point I wanted to make is, you know, I, I try to put myself, if I was on the city council right now and 
I would be extremely annoyed if I was a council member right now because, you know, I'm looking at this from a, an executive management leadership position. This seems like a lot of micromanagement of city staff. I think they could be delegated. There's no reason to have a study session here tonight. This could have been an agenda item on a, on a regular city council meeting. But what it says is, like, you don't understand what the city knows and that you need to go ahead and micromanage them to make decisions. This is ridiculous. Obviously, everybody here on staff is a subject matter expert. They know way more than you. Secondly, you know, if I was in the, also a council member was in this meeting, I would be irate by the number of members that showed up tonight completely unprepared. You need to go ahead and do your own, own homework when you come to these meetings so the decisions are made. This was dragged on. This started at five o'clock, by the way. I didn't even, you know, I have to work till six. I couldn't even get on here. But this, this was dragged out. It was horribly run meeting, horribly run meeting. This should have been, this should have been not more than 90 minutes, maybe 60 minute meeting. But it, this is micromanagement, the city staff. This should have been delegated to city staff come back with the staff report. We'll make a decision on the city council meeting. Just my two cents on how I run, but it seems like there's just a lot of micromanagement here. Just wanted to share that. Thank you. Good night. God bless. Okay, I have one more speaker, Laura Pena. Um, and if you would like to speak, please raise your virtual hand. Go ahead, Laura. Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, you can go ahead and speak. Oh, thank you. Um, hello, my name is Laura Pena. I wanna thank the mayor and the city council and staff for the pro uh, opportunity to provide feedback this evening. And I, I appreciate the amount of discussions and questions because it helps me um, with a level of transparency to see what's going on and what you guys are thinking. So I just really appreciate that. I wanna provide comment or, and some questions on the following items on the recommendations. First, on the first recommendation on implementing an app-based mobile pay system, will the community and the stakeholders be able to provide feedback on a demo that is being proposed or is the city gonna decide on its own what program we will use? Since this is gonna impact our community, I think we should have some kind of input on what actually is being done. Second, is there consideration for removing the parking meter poles and utilizing a more sidewalk friendly parking system where you can buy parking at kiosks? And this is not uh, regarding the substantial upgrade ones that have been done, but it would be nice to transition to something that was more sidewalk friendly since the poles are not only ugly, but we're trying to provide more access um, for our businesses. Second, um, on, on the demand strategies, Certain parts of our city could utilize a pay once and walk parking system, but please realize that different areas in our downtown may need different options. Upper Pier needs turnover in its parking. So many businesses depend on their clientele being able to park and have their services done. The third one is on sign, signage and wayfinding. I'd like to see examples of where you're gonna provide signage. The recommendation talks about an upgraded electric sign for parking structures. We could utilize more signage near the green belt coming into the city to inform visitors, residents uh, where to park. On the fifth recommendation, to maximize flexibility of curb space to accommodate ride share and valet. It is my understanding we all, uh, all of our ride share pickup and drop offs are in three spots on Hermosa Avenue. Since we want to improve accessibility on other parts of our downtown like Upper Pier, can we adopt additional ride share drops near areas like the skate park and across so we can increase access and foot traffic through more parts of our business community. And furthermore, I would recommend we reinvestigate the actual need for requiring all the parking on BARD for security purposes behind the gate. Maybe moving the gate area back to allow a valet park or ride share opportunities could be more useful. Um, also, have we reviewed how flex zones in our commercial districts could utilize loading ride share and 15 minute spots. I wanna briefly comment on the residential parking and employee parking program. From my understanding, both programs utilize public space. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Can you provide a rationale for why residents who have garages, which are not utilized for their cars are charged different rates than businesses for parking? We try to utilize all of our parking before even considering buying permits. And most importantly, on the north side of Pier Avenue, our businesses are not allowed eligible 
for any employee parking permits because we are not included in the impact zone. That has to change at minimum. I've been advocating for this and I've been told that it's a coastal commission issue. It should be dealt with now if we want to um, have it in a cost effective manner. Because right now we pay three times as much as any other business. And then lastly, I noticed after reviewing the citation fees, um, does driving on the sidewalk, which is a ride drive moon violation, does that include e-bike riders who use our sidewalks as roads? If so, how many citations have been given? And if not, why isn't it included? And I also wanted to comment on Jonathan Wick's question about residents not using their garages. Is that part of the citation funds or is that not even being accounted for? So thank you very much for your time. Thank you. We have no more speakers at this time, Mr. Mayor. This will be the last call for public participation. Mouse down to the bottom of the screen and raise your virtual hand. If you're joining us by telephone, dial star nine to raise your virtual hand. Okay, we have one more, Robert Fortuna. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, City Council and staff. Uh, this is Robert Fortunato, um, longtime resident of Hermosa Beach. And I just wanted to echo a number of the comments made about electric vehicles. Um, it is uh, absolute ne necessity to support electrical ve vehicle adoption. And we really ap appreciate everything Hermosa Beach has done to do that. Um, from the very beginning, <clears throat> a number of us advocated for putting metered uh, charging on for the reason that has been expressed. Um, in the very beginning, uh, it was so rare that there was an electric vehicle in town. We were happy <laughs> to have anyone uh, expressing an interest in it. Uh, and now, as you can see, uh, it's much more um, common. And um, to actually charge for it puts a, a value on it that's, that's valuable. Uh, and you can vary those rates depending on the time of the day or the you know events and other things. And uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, for um, you know folks who can't actually afford to pay, there could be uh, you know accommodations for that. So I think there are a number of advantages to changing the system at this point that uh, many of us are very open to. And uh, we still want to encourage electric vehicle adoption. Um, and we think that you know we're at a different stage right now and would like to encourage a, a different system that might um, be more beneficial for everyone. Thanks very much. Thank you. One last call, public comment. Mouse on to your bottom of your screen. Seeing no other hands raised and no one else in chambers, I'll go ahead and close this public participation. Madam City Clerk. Okay, so we're going on to municipal matters now. And that is a consideration of postponing the sale of the 2022-2023 residential and employee parking permits and directing staff to notice a public hearing to enable the council to consider an increase in residential and employee permit parking rates retroactive to February 1st, 2022. This is being presented by City Manager Suja Lowenthal. Madam City Manager. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm sorry, give me one second. I inadvertently closed off. That report. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and members of the council. This item is in response to to council's desire to have the opportunity to consider whether you would like to provide instruction to the staff to postpone the sale of the 2022 pass. And you've had quite a bit of discussion this evening regarding the various parking programs that we have. And one item is that tomorrow, the 2022 pass would go on sale unless you directed us Otherwise, in order to consider any of the changes that you have discussed and shown some consensus over, you've asked us to bring some items back through a 
council agenda item. And in order to do that, if they were to impact parking pass sales, you would need to instruct us, provide us direction, at least a majority of you, in order to postpone the sale tomorrow so that we can have time to either hold a public hearing, should that be necessary, or time to work up an item and bring it back to you for your consideration. So it's a staff, it's a short staff report, Mr. Mayor, but I'm happy to answer any questions or any questions the council may have. Thank you for that. I'll look to my colleagues for any questions. Yes, Councilwoman Campbell. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to um, clarify or re-clarify what I felt like I was hearing um, during the course of the evening, which is anything that would represent a change, no matter what it was, would be subject to Coastal Commission review and therefore would have some kind of extended timeline. I don't know how how long, even if it was an administrative request. Um, can I can I get staff to verify that I've heard that correctly first before I weigh in? You have council member Campbell. Can any finer point to that? Um, yes, that's absolutely correct. It's a specific condition of the preferential parking district permit approval that any changes including um, Fees are uh, require notification of the Coastal Commission, um, and they determine whether it requires full amendment to that permit or if it's something they can do administratively. Uh, thank you. You know, and just given that, um, I'm just inclined to mess with the current cycle um, for reasons maybe I, I don't really have to articulate in any level of great detail other than. Um, the timeline that is upon us right now, uh, uh, some kind of extended timeline that is retroactive if it were to be approved eventually uh, seems unnecessary and messy. And um, I'd rather plan forward with the guidance uh, that we provide to staff um, to to make those changes happen in the future in future cycles as early as the next cycle. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. And uh, we do have to open this up for public comment. So again, just let's focus on the questions right now for staff, if there's any. Mayor Pro Tem is about to wind up. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> I mean, I, at the end of the day, if council were to recommend any change going forward in who pays and how much and limitations, that all requires coastal commission approval. Or is it, is it just so if we came back, if staff said we'd like to, excuse me, if, if council recommended we limit, you can't register 25 vehicles, you limit it to four or three, um, and that if you don't have a vehicle registered in the state of California, you are not um, able to get a Hermosa Beach residential parking permit. Are there any of those that could be implemented sooner versus later? Um, the EV piece maybe, the non-residential, the non-California residential license piece. Um, what could we do without Coastal Commission, and what could we do without? Um, I will actually read, since uh, Councilmember Campbell asked a question, I will read the actual language in the permit. There's a section called Changes in Preferential Parking Program. That's the title. The language says the commission has approved the preferential program as described in its permit 5-84-236 as amended. Any change, including but not limited to changes in the location of the remote parking spaces, the duration of the free parking, the amounts of fees for on-street parking or day passes, or any other feature of the program shall be reported to the executive director 
to determine whether an amendment to the permit is necessary. And the executive director in this clause is the executive director of the Coastal Commission. And that is the permit that is attached to um, the report, but it, it's, that's on page five of the permit. And so I'd have to defer to the city attorney on the implications of that, but it sounds uh, fairly clear to me. But. And, and I, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, would uh, refer back to something that Ken said earlier uh, during the study session, and that is that um, the precise uh, process that would be required by the Coastal Commission staff is uncertain at this point in time, and the precise amount of time that would be required for coastal approval is uncertain at this time. But, and I would invite Ken to disagree with me if he thinks I'm wrong about this, but um, the, the objective of the Coastal Commission is to assure the availability of parking for visitors to the beach. Um, that's why um, um, it, the Coastal Commission looks very closely at measures like residential permit parking that um, reduce the amount of parking available for visitors by creating an opportunity for residents to use on street spaces with the use of permits and in effect to monopolize a certain number of the spaces that are available where the permit parking is allowed. The measures that you have been discussing this evening, reducing the number of permits available per resident, increasing the cost of the parking permits would be consistent with Coastal Commission policy and consistent with the Coastal Commission's mission of increasing the availability of on-street parking spaces by, in effect, reducing the number of spaces being occupied by residents. In that regard, I would make, I would speculate, because I have not discussed this with Coastal staff, that Coastal staff would greet any such changes to the city's program um, with um, a, a, a positive approach. In other words, they would react positively to these changes, not negatively, and might very well not even require an amendment, um, but might approve it administratively. But that I, I cannot be certain of, and Ken might have an opinion about that. But I don't want you to think that the Coastal Commission's approval with respect to the proposed changes, the ones you've been discussing, would be a serious obstacle because I think the Coastal Commission would invite those sorts of changes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. City Attorney, and thank you, Ken. I appreciate that. Um, that's all I got, thank you. I, actually, I, if I can go back to a couple of comments from the callers, Mr. Mayor. Is now the appropriate time or is it inappropriate for me to flesh out an issue that was raised? Uh, I will look to the city attorney for that one. Well, are, um, are we still in the questions? Um, mode here, if we are, I think that we should exhaust the council's questions of staff and then um, take public comment and then council can respond to the public and deliberate. That, that would be the usual process. Okay, thank you, sir. Because uh, Commissioner Grayson, or do I need to wait till after? We open it back up. It was from the previous agenda item. Let's say save it till after we open public comment again. Okay, got it. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? I do have one. Is there a low income, senior fixed income payment program uh, with the current preferential parking passes? Mm 
No, Mayor, there is not. Okay. Thank you. Any last comments? Question or any last questions? Madam City Clerk, can you queue up public comment, please? Mr. Mayor, we have no speakers at this time. Uh, I'll go and find Mr. Higgins, but if you'd like to speak, please raise your hand. So anyone who has not spoken tonight on consideration of postponing the sale of the 2022-2023 residential employee parking permits, mouse down to the bottom of the screen, raise your virtual hand. If you're joining us by telephone, dial star nine. Seeing no hands, I'll go ahead and close public comment. Bring it back to my colleagues. Any comments, deliberation? Councilmember Massey. Mayor, if I understand it correctly, the concern is that we would need Coastal Commission approval to adjust the rates of our parking permits. And if we were to push off the date for sale of the parking permits, we might have to push it off some significant period of time to await Coastal Commission approval. And then the counter argument to that is from the city attorney that essentially, if we were to update the parking permit rates and raise them uh, and limit the number of parking permits that that would be uh, expected to be received favorably by the Coastal Commission and likely approved. Um, I'm not sure if I'm understanding it correctly, but is that your understanding, Mr. Mayor, of the two concerns that have been raised? Yeah, I think the, with the city attorney raised the point of the number of parking permits. Um, I wasn't too sure about the increasing the rates um, in his comments, but. My, my comment was the same with respect to both of those proposals, namely that to the extent that um, the increase in the rates and the um, and the limitation on the number tend to diminish the number of permits that are approved, issued, and out in the world, that will, either because people perceive that the, the cost is higher than they're prepared to pay, um, and or because they are limited from getting more than three, um, that that would increase the number of on-street spaces available to people visiting the coast, which is a, um, one of the two principal uh, missions of the Coastal Act is to um, is to is to um, enhance um, visitor serving resources, which includes parking spaces. So it, it was with reference to both. Well, Mr. Mayor, I would I would say this: I'm comfortable postponing the sale of our parking permits to allow us to hold a public hearing to adjust those rates. Um, with one caveat, and that is if there's a sentiment amongst council that they're willing to update our rates to more appropriately value what people are getting for the permits um, and limit those permits so that they're not overutilized if they have been, as they have been, if we were to have those adjusted rates effective in 2023, then I'm willing to entertain that. Um, I'd rather not get into a postponement of our 2022 permit rates if what we're going to hear from council is that it's too fast, we can't, you know, adjust the rates to something remotely approaching what they're worth. Uh, we could only do that if it was going to be effective in 2023. Um, you know, if that was the sentiment amongst council, then, you know, I would entertain having the rates that we discuss effective in 2023 and not postponing the sale of the 2022 permits. Um, because as you all know, uh, in my opinion, these permits are grossly undervalued, um, which creates all sorts of negative consequences that we've discussed tonight. And they need to be significantly adjusted, um, whether it be 
starting in 2022 or in 2023. And so I simply don't want to get into a position where we have council members saying, I want to significantly adjust them so that they approximate the value of what the permit holders are getting. Uh, I just don't want to do it for 2022. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your thoughts. Anyone else? Yes, Councilwoman Campbell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a question based on my colleagues um, just made comments about the process. So um, if the majority of council were uncomfortable making changes for the current cycle that essentially starts tomorrow, would have started tomorrow, is scheduled to start tomorrow, um, what would be the process of public hearing based on the feedback that we've gotten that we are interested in approaching changes to several aspects of our parking permit program. And uh, there were actually many things. So when would a public hearing happen um, to consider those different options and come to some you know, more, more refined final direction for this, for uh, going to the Coastal Commission? What would be the timing of that hearing? Councilmember Campbell, if you're, if the will of the council is to consider changes for the 2023 cycle and not 2022, the timing, we could come back to you with a work plan on the timing of the hearing. It wouldn't have to be as soon as it would be if you wanted to make those changes for 2022. The other piece that wasn't discussed, it just didn't come up naturally, is there is software that we use for parking, um, uh, for the parking pass purchases. And the vendor, when we checked last week, the vendor had indicated that it would take two months to make software adjustments for, to change from unlimited number of passes to the graduated uh, pricing and the restrictions. So I'm not sure why software adjustments take that long. I'm just taking that at face value, but I just wanted to share that with you that um, we hadn't shared that earlier. But to answer your question specifically, we, we could come back with a clear time frame of when to bring that. It, you know, given our own work plan, it wouldn't have to be as immediate as a 2022 set of changes would be. Okay, um, thank you. As I'm digesting all of this, I guess I, I will just reiterate uh, and apologies, Mr. Mayor, for waging a leaning uh, prior to public comment on this. But um, if we if we postponed the current renewal cycle, all of the current permits would remain in effect. Is that not correct? So the person who has 25 keeps 25 until we're done with the delay, correct? Um, correct. Yes. Okay, so they just they just roll. They do. Right. So okay. the validity of the 2021 will be extended by the time you are delaying the sale. Um, there, there's the time frame when the grace period is. So all of, all of that would have to be adjusted. Yeah, um, and I just, I mean, unless I hear something different, my strong gut and my my um, mind both align on there's there's a lot yet to be considered. There's more public discourse opportunity and there's several aspects of of these um, parking issues uh, that need to go to Coastal Commission, even if they're friendly to an administ some administrative changes. Um, and I, I, I still feel like it would make more sense to let the next cycle ensue and then continue to move forward uh, with a set of recommendations that um, I'm also now comfortable given tonight's discussion, we could forward to the Coastal Commission um, administratively, if you will, that is, you know, sort of outside of our larger project with them, um, given that it would represent improvements to the equation <laughs> uh, for the attended mission, as 
Mr. City Attorney was articulating. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for that. And based on the information from the city manager in the two month um, guide path for the change in the software, I'm, I'm not inclined to postpone the sale of the 2022 and uh, not put the pressure on staff to come back with an item immediately and um, kind of give staff the direction to have an item with the public hearing with uh, based on our conversation tonight on number of permits maximum and, and the pay, how much they cost um, sometime during our next calendar year. But I'll field any other thoughts from my colleagues. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I tend to agree with Justin. I mean, I, my preference would be to see some increase. Now, it may not be the 120, 240, 480 um, that was outlined earlier, um, but maybe it's 50, maybe it's 75, maybe it's, it's something. Um, and if that means, and I'd like to see, you know, all those folks that have 10 and 25 vehicles registered um, not have the opportunity to roll that over into next year. I don't want to kick this can down the road. And if that means a two month delay, a month and a half delay in order to have our public hearing to flesh these issues out and to maybe have a friendly ask to the Coastal Commission, I think that's certainly worth, worth pursuing. Um, you know, you, you look at those numbers and they're staggering. They're, they're, they're mind boggling. So many people have abused the system and I don't think that we as a city should allow them to abuse the system for another year to the detriment of other residents and other visitors that want to come to our, our town. So uh, to the extent possible, I, I think we should consider some increase, uh, maybe not the full fledged that was outlined by Justin, uh, the 122-4040 that I agree with, but some increase, uh, certainly a limitation on the numbers. I, I like the number three that we all sort of seem to settle on. Um, coupled with the friendly ask to Coastal Commission. And if we can make that happen the next month and a half to two months, I think that's time well spent um, that at the end of the day is, is in the best interest of the city. And, and then next year, we can implement the full 122, 40, 480, or whatever that number is that we've uh, agreed upon. And then we can also look to incorporate the zones that we talked about, um, but my preference, again, um, is I'm, I'm inclined to support a delay if we can make it happen in the next month or two. Thank you, sir. Yes, Councilmember Massey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'll just offer that for 2022, we could, um, if the council is disinclined to raise the rate for the or the fee for the initial permit, we could certainly consider uh, double the cost for the second permit, double the cost for the third permit, and limit it to three permits, something like that, so that we're limiting the total number of permits and we're disincentivizing people from using, uh, you know, as many permits as they possibly think they might ever need to use. Um, so, you know, there's definitely certain ways to uh, indicate to folks, you know, price it more appropriately, as well as indicate to folks that um, we're working on a different structure um, and more appropriate rates so that, you know, when we have the public hearing about our 2023 and beyond rates, uh, folks have a pretty good idea that uh, they've been getting uh, more than a fair deal for quite a while. And we're beginning the process of reforming that fee structure. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, sir. Any other deliberation, motion, comments? I, I have a question, Mr. Mayor. Um, can Madam City Manager clarify if, um, or can, can we, for staff, can you make an administrative decision to limit the number of parking passes to some number 
staff deems reasonable um, starting tomorrow? No, we cannot. Um, I think even just, um, it was also stated in what Ken read under the permit. Location, duration, amount of fees, or any other feature. So that would be under, or any other feature, unless Ken reads that differently. And, um, okay. Um, and we think this process could take a couple months. To go to the commission? Correct. Yeah. At least, at least. And, it would be, and, I, and I'm sure this is what you're encouraging, but um, we haven't shared it, but our recommendation would be if there were a set of changes the majority of you were inclined to recommend, we should go to the Coastal Commission rep and ask for permission. And so that piece, in addition to the software timeframe, I would, I would guess that it would be at least a couple of months or more. Um, Mayor, um, I, 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 I'm a little reluctant to, this is, this is not a question that, that Suja and I have talked about. And so I, I don't want to necessarily contradict her answer, but I also want to be sure that you do what you feel you want to do here if it's within legal parameters. And Council Member Armada, what I hear you asking is if you were to direct us tonight not to issue more than three parking permits to any resident pending a further review by the City Council of that policy during which time we would approach coastal staff and discuss what process would be required to make that um, change permanent. Um, I think we can do it, if that's what your question was, was leading to. Yeah, and actually that would be good. Um, I'd be more inclined to move forward and um, pause the issuance of the 2022 parking permit and um, hold a public hearing on the topic, bring it to the, the Coastal Commission, obviously, um, and have a more full discussion on it. If we could at least, um, or sorry, yeah, wait. If we would do it that way, staff could cap the number of permits and then we could and then we could hold a public hearing on whether or not we wanted to make that permanent and whether or not we wanted to increase rates so how would we actually how would we do that how would that play out that gets really um complicated so if we hold if staff goes ahead and limits it to three, we go ahead and hold a public hearing and we ultimately decide that we want to raise rates. Um, maybe we don't cap it at three. Um, residents could be charged more on, you know, number four or five permit. I mean, I it, it gets a, I think it could get very complicated and messy um, and, and could be um, difficult on, the administration side. So I don't know. We may need, just need to go one way or the other. Um, and if we move forward with a public hearing, it would be to be implemented in 2023. Um, Council member, the, the instruction to not sell more than three, the number of permits still requires a software change with the vendor. And so that's, so that would also be the two month, within the two month delay or the two month time frame, they need to make that software change. I mean, that's crazy. So you, we couldn't limit the number like with the flick of a switch. I mean, it really. So if I can have 
our finance director just share a little bit more context to that response. She has been in touch with the vendor. Yes, they said um, if if we wanted to just change the rate that we have now, no problem. That would take a week. Um, if we want to either limit the number of permits, because the system handles all of this. It's not handled manually by the people that are selling the permits. It's handled by the system. When people online renew, they would have to change the software to limit the permits. And that's, that's what takes the two months. Likewise, if you um, adopt a tiered rate schedule, rather than just a flat rate schedule as it is now, <clears throat> it's the same thing. It's gonna take a month and a half to two months. I mean, I, <clears throat> it's crazy to me. I mean, I can't imagine any software program where you couldn't say there's a max number of permits that could be issued for this address, right? I mean, that's how it's tracked per address. So um, maybe that was their, you know, initial response, but I can't imagine that playing out. I, I think just if I could explain just a bit more, um, they have 40 to 50 clients waiting for changes now. So they're saying it's a matter of priorities. And I guess even, even the two months was if we were able to get priority over other projects that had requests in for us, which I'm assuming we could, but that is still the same answer from them two months. So got it. Passing it along. Okay. Thank you for the context on that. Um, well, I, I guess I left to, you know, Mr. Mayor, um, I don't know what, it, what is your inclination? I'm, I guess I'm not clear on that either. Um, my inclination is that we don't rush this, uh, as it, there's a couple thousand dollars of postcards and mailers that are about to go out and, you know, staff has our, our deliberations tonight and any changes we make would be effective for the 23 cycle. And we'd hold a public hearing sometime throughout this calendar year and, and make sure that we're not literally discussing this tonight before parking permits go on sale. Okay, so in that scenario, we could direct staff to limit the number of parking permits pending, who cares, pending, who cares, they could, they could limit it, right? Mr. City Attorney? But according to Vicki, it's still a two month delay in the software for- Well, even if it's a two month delay, which hopefully it could be less, um, that would require everyone, I mean, maybe the ward would get out, you know, get your permits now so you can sell them on the black market or something. I don't know what someone's doing with 25 parking passes, but um, it was 25, not 29. Thank you for correcting me earlier, Vicki. Um, um, but at least, you know, so you would have that two month window where maybe we couldn't control the number of them, but after that, we could. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So, <clears throat> Vicki, if I understand the process, there is the, I go online and register my vehicle. What about when the city sends me my little card and it says, do you want parking permits for your eight vehicles? And I go, yep, 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 eight times. And then I get my stickers in the mail. Uh, that's what I was referring to, the online system. So that's the online, that's not me going online and saying, I want to renew my four. That's the city sending me my little postcard that they send me every year that says, do you want to re-register your four vehicles? And then I can re-register whether I actually have those four vehicles or not and give the sticker to my friend, the mayor, who doesn't have one. Is that, because I get the postcard in the mail that comes and says, do you want your parking passes renewed? And I say, yay or nay, and pay accordingly. Yes, and what, I'm sorry, what is the question? So is, is, is that the online process, or is the online where I go physically online and say, I want my four passes, or are they, oh. It's both. 
Yes, it's both. It's the online system handles that. And actually, as I said, even if we were doing it another way, the system still has to be set up to be sure that we're not allowing over the limit of permits. So right. it, it's all, it all works together or so. Okay. So it's the, it's the online system that's going to generate that card that comes to me that says, do I want to register my 12 vehicles or not? Yes. Okay. Um, I, 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 you know, I am inclined to support the, I, I like, you know, if it's going to take two months, it takes two months. And if it takes two months to, to stop some of the abuse, I think it's time well spent. I think if it's, if we can allow those who do not have California residency to those 148 or whatever, whatever that number is that are not military on active duty orders, then they should not enjoy another year of, of parking. Um, and I think that's two months well spent. And I like the idea of, of the point you made, Justin. Okay, maybe this year it's $40 for your first, $80 for your second, and $120 for your third slash visitor. Um, and again, if we have to wait two months to cap it anyway, uh, it sounds to me that we have more than enough time for the public hearing and then the friendly administrative ask to the Coastal Commission, which based on our city attorney is, uh, is we stand a good chance of getting that approved because at the end of the day, we are increasing access for our visitors um, and that is the one of the goals of the Coastal Commission. So I, I think a two month delay is uh, a good delay in order to not kick this down the road any further and wait till next year to implement some of these changes that are needed sooner versus later. Thank you, sir. Yes, Councilwoman Campbell. I have one more specific question. I agree, I resonate completely with what Council Member Armato said about how convoluted this can get. Um, one concern I have is I, I would be I would be shocked if this only took two months. But if we are delaying something until the start of a cycle and the cycle still ends at the same time next year, are we gonna if we if we delayed it and got administrative approval and it took four months or two months or six months, does the cycle start when it's approved for a year or does it just run out the remainder of the current cycle, February one to February one? And um, I don't know if we've talked about that because if it took four months or six months, then I guess it would deter people from overbuying for a half a year. But what are they going to pay if it's only, would it be prorated till February 1, the new rates? Um, and you can probably tell my leaning is still to do the work, make the decisions, get the approvals and implement in the next cycle. But I wanted to add that new question. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Councilwoman Romato. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think, uh, after this discussion and just confusing myself even more, I think um, we move forward with, you know, issuing parking permits um, starting tomorrow. As much as it pains me, I, I uh, you know, just looking at the pricing, maybe not, like I said, for the first one, but for the second and the third and then the 19th and the 20th, I mean, um, it's crazy, but I think we need to realize the challenges um, with the software company, with the Coastal Commission, um, the administrative time um, that it's going to take on, you know, its toll on staff. And I think also the confusion that it's going to bring um, to our community. Um, I'm I'm worried about, um, you know, people are going to be frantically trying to get their parking pass renewed, and we're going to say, no, 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 it's okay. You know, it's going to be good longer and it's kind of like a word of mouth thing and um you know i i could see you know being inundated with calls and what do they do and what have you so um 
can we can have a great robust discussion discussion about implementing this starting in 2023. I think um, it give the community a better opportunity to be engaged in the process, be informed, and and feel better that you know changes are happening incrementally, not immediately. We know that our community responds better to to that than um, immediate change. Um, despite me agreeing that change needs to happen, big change for sure. Um, but I think if we want to see progress and we don't want it to be cumbersome um, and we want it to roll out smoothly and be understood by everybody and really plan for it, um, I'm glad we're having this discussion that we would have um, you know, a public hearing sooner than later um, and submit this over to the Coastal Commission, what have you. Um, sooner than later, um, I think we can, I don't know, I, I definitely think that it's better to just move forward with tomorrow and issue those permits and talk about 2023 moving forward. Thank you for that, Council Member Massey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think it sounds like there's a council majority for going forward with issuing parking permits tomorrow. Um, I just want to say that, you know, I agree with Council Member Jackson, or excuse me, Mayor Pro Tem Jackson. Um, I think there's a few things we could do, uh, an escalating rate structure, requiring permit holders to have their vehicles registered in California and limiting the number of permits. At a minimum, those three changes are reasons why I support postponing the sale of our 2022 permits and having a public hearing to institute those changes now while we consider additional, uh, more significant changes for 2023 and beyond. Um, and so for that reason, you know, my vote will be to postpone, but if it sounds like, it sounds to me like there's at least three council members who uh, would like to go forward to start issuing 2022 permits tomorrow and then have our public hearing geared towards 2023 and beyond. So I think we ought to move that to a motion and put it to a vote. Well, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Not to mischaracterize. I'm not liking it at all. Um, I would love to be able to postpone it, but I, I worry about um, the negative effect of that. So. Mayor Pertem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. City Attorney, could we at a minimum, seeing I, I'm on the, the negative side of this discussion at this point, could we at a minimum at least not issue permits to individuals who reside here but who are not California residents? Or does that require the same two months public hearing? And I mean, I that is the law is you have to register your vehicle in the state of California within 20 days. We currently have a hundred and something plus folks, I would, who are not California residents according to the vehicle registration, who enjoy the privilege of parking on our streets at 11 cents a day. Um, is that something we could do administratively? Now, at a minimum? Mayor Tim, I'm going to, um, I'm going to have to defer to uh, Vicki on the question of what, what the logistics are for, for that change. Um, because I just I just don't know. But from a purely legal perspective, I will just I will just uh, refer back to my answer to Council Member Armato's earlier question, which was that it seemed to me that if the um, the agenda item tonight proposed the possibility of deferring um, the issuance of 2022-23 uh, residential parking permits altogether until a public hearing. Um, and, and council consideration of changes to the program. And it seems to me that the council could do the same less comprehensively so that the council could, in other words, pick and choose those aspects of the program it wishes to uh, change, if not the fees this time around, then perhaps the, the, um, <clears throat> the specific issue you're referring to now. But again, I don't know if it's feasible to do that 
without a change in the in the program. And if that's the case, then it would require some more time. So I'm just going to have to defer to Vicki to answer that. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Um, I can answer that. Um, I think that, um, I don't know, Mike, if they could just pass a resolution to implement that, that, that's something that we can implement. We don't need software. We don't need anything else to do that. We just, the, the people that were out of state last year, when they registered this year, they would have to register and be registered in California anyway. So we could just say that you have to register in California before you can get a parking permit at, at your legal address. We, we could implement that. Fine, and if, if that's something the council wants to do, the council would need to take a vote to give us direction to do that tonight, and then we could do that. Thank you. All right, any motions out there? I'd be supportive of encompassing the out-of-state, in-state requirement. And a motion. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, do you want to make that in a motion? I'm happy to support that too. I don't know if he's in favor of uh, postponing. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm happy to make a motion and you want me to include um, restricting uh, issuance to, well, I mean, if we could restrict the issuance uh, to out of state registered vehicles, um, that's gonna take a software change, right? right? No. No, oh. No. Okay, never mind. Okay, I was going to add in all sorts of other things then. Yeah. All right, I'll move that. Um, um, I guess does a notion. Um, um, I'll move that we move forward with the the sale of the renewal of the 2022-2023 residential and employee parking permits. Um, and notice a uh, public hearing to enable council to consider an increase um, for 2023 moving forward um, and restrict um, issuance of uh, parking permits to out of state vehicles. I will second that with the friendly amendment to make sure that if they're active duty military, they can get their permit. With the exception of active military. Yes, thank you. Councilwoman Mr. Campbell. Mayor. Oh, sorry, Madam City Manager. Just a quick clarification from Councilmember Armato. Uh, the second part of your motion was to notice, notice residents for the increase in 2023. Is well, I mean, I don't know. I was keeping in there that we were going to have a public hearing. I'd like this process to keep moving forward. So do we, don't we want to have a public hearing to talk about whether or not we're going to increase rates for next year? Would you like us to bring back an item at a future agenda proposing the options that were discussed tonight where a public hearing could be set for that meeting? Yes. That would be the notice. Yes. So that could be a notice, correct? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Councilwoman Campbell. Uh, thank you. I, I have a question and, and I'm officially confused because if if we if we started selling for 2022-2023 tomorrow, um, and currently that cycle includes everything that it includes right now how would we accomplish not allowing out of state or not allowing a cap number or what any of the other administrative changes without stopping and delaying the whole process? 
And Councilmember Campbell, I believe what we just learned from our finance director is that that could be achieved by the council passing a resolution okay, on just the out-of-state piece. So that means no one could go into the system tomorrow with an out-of-state license and buy a permit in our system? We would have to review those, but there are not that many is what I'm thinking, that we would be able to do that manually, whereas the rest of the, the permitting system you would not be able to do manually. And is this because we, um, we ask for proof of registration? Yes, California, we ask for California registration. So if they don't have it, it's kind of an exception. And that's how staff knows the number that we have. Yeah. From out of state. Yeah. Okay. Does that answer your question? I, I, yes, I think it does. Um, because it's different than the one, like if we could do that and still, we could, we could talk about other things like limiting the maximum number. Yeah, that, yeah, that's the part that takes the software or the change in the fees to a tiered structure. Those both definitely take uh, a software change. Well, and I want to be clear because I'm like poking at the at the messiness, that's my word, for what we're talking about doing inside of the current cycle that starts tomorrow. But um, and I completely support the changes that were discussed. And I think we could do a better job of increasing the rates with the time. If we can um, go forward with the current cycle and there's an administrative way to ensure out of state vehicles and because that's in staff hands uh, with council direction, I'm happy to support that. Um, and I guess the reason for my additional clarification is that is there any noticing that we need to do to people who have a different understanding of their ability to not require a California well if they if they have moved here and they are have rented an apartment or bought a house and they're going to live here they should register their vehicle anyway so they just need to do it and then they can get a parking permit I won't stop them from getting a parking permit. It's just they need to go ahead and register their vehicle first if they've just moved here, for example. Okay. With direction tonight, would a person who just moved here from a different state with a different license plate not be able to purchase? Well, let, me, let, me, let me answer your question. The answer to your question is that's correct. They would not be able to purchase it until they registered. But it's not a permanent bar. It doesn't prevent them from getting a permit in this uh, current year if they register. Mm -hmm. So all they have to do is register. So unlike the other changes, for example, you know, imposing a cap of three, um, this one is fixable. It's curable, right? All a person has to do is cure by registering their vehicle, and then they can get a permit. Okay. All right. All right. Um, I could support um, that direction, which I'll just restate is going forward with the current program beginning tomorrow with this uh, last administrative um, capability of limiting out of state vehicles from getting permits if unless until they register. Thank you for that. Any other comments? Uh, yes, Councilmember Massey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, <clears throat> I think we've had a great conversation. I'm, I think there's a lot of commonality amongst us all. Um, so I, while I won't be supporting it simply because I feel we could do more in this cycle, I look forward to the conversation we have about 2023 and beyond. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Appreciate that. All right. I look forward to that conversation as well. Until then, Madam City Clerk. Council Member Massey? No. Council Member Campbell? 
Aye. Council Member Amato. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Jackson. No. And Mayor Detoy. Aye. Motion carries 3 2. Thank you for that. So that will bring us to adjournment. So this meeting is now adjourned to closed session, but I'll turn it over to the city attorney first. Um, Mayor, members of the city council, um, you will recall that last year, the city council adopted a policy um, for um, mandatory vaccination of city employees. And um, as part of the process for adopting that policy, the city was required to meet and confer with employee associations that represent the uh, various bargaining groups of city employees. Um, one of those groups um, was the POA, the Police Officers Association. So the city met and conferred with all of the associations with respect to the implementation of the city's policy on mandatory vaccinations. City Council, after the meet and confer process, you'll recall, then adopted the policy. Um, and then the policy required mandatory vaccination. It allowed for individual employees to apply for exemptions on the basis of religion or on the basis of medical condition. And then it um, contained a requirement that the employees if their um, requested exemption was denied, um, be vaccinated within a set period of time, um, after which um, they would be separated from employment. Um, after the posting of tonight's agenda, um, a representative of the POA approached the city manager um, to request uh, um, essentially a resumption of uh, meet and confer relative to the that issue, the issue of um, the um, deadline for um, um, employees for whom an exemption is denied uh, uh, to be vaccinated. Um, and consequently, um, the city manager is requesting that we now add to tonight's agenda a closed session for the purpose of giving direction to the city's labor negotiator, um, for the purpose of um, discussing and giving direction on the subject of, um, of implementation of the policy with respect to the deadline for um, obtaining a vaccination with respect to those employees who have not yet been vaccinated and whose uh, exemption requests have been denied. Now, government code section um, 54957.6 excuse me, 5495, uh, 5.6, excuse me, allows the city council to go into closed session to discuss labor negotiations um, and to give direction to the city's labor negotiator. If we first identify um, the city's labor negotiator and the party with whom we are negotiating. In this instance, the city's labor negotiator would be the city manager, Susan Lowenthal, and we'd be negotiating with the um, Police Officers Association, which is the association that represents uh, rank and file police officers in the city. Um, but because this item was not on tonight's agenda, the city council will need to vote by a two thirds vote to add this closed session, as I've just described it, onto tonight's agenda. And so with that, Mayor, um, I would ask one of the council members to make a motion to add a closed session pursuant to government code section 549.57.6 um, to add a closed session for purposes of giving direction to the city's labor negotiator with respect to the issue I've just described, identifying Susie Lowenthal as the city's um, negotiator and um, the POA as the party with whom the city is negotiating. Um, and that concludes my report, Mayor. Thank you for that. Do we have to open that up for public comment? Yes, we do, Mayor. Okay, so should I take the motion first or open up to public yes, comment? Yes, let's first? get the motion on the floor. Okay. Councilmember Massey. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I move that we hold a closed session to consider whether to appoint the city manager to be our labor negotiator for purposes of meeting and conferring with the Police Officers Association on the topic just described by the city attorney. 
You got second. it. A second by Councilman William and Armato. This now open up public comment. Is that correct, Mr. City Attorney? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Madam City Clerk. Uh, please raise your virtual hand if you'd like to speak. At this time, we have nobody speaking, uh, requesting to speak. Yes, Mayor. All right. I will remind everyone to mouse down to the bottom of the screen if you'd like to speak on this subject. If you're joining us by telephone, dial star nine to raise your virtual hand. One last call for public comment. Seeing no hands, I'll go ahead and close public comment. Any questions or comments from my colleagues? Madam City Clerk. Councilmember Massey. Aye. Councilmember Campbell. Aye. Councilmember Amato. Aye. Mayor Pro Tem Jackson. Aye. Mayor DeToy. Aye. Motion carries 5 0. The mayor, um, um, are you going to be uh, remaining there in City Hall for the closed session? If so, will you be in a position to return to the chambers to make the announcement at the conclusion of closed session? I can. Great. So the mayor will um, return to the chambers at the conclusion of closed session to make any required announcement. We will now be recessing to closed session.
Hey there, Susan. Um, the mayor's going to come back. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Is there anyone in chambers? Just staff. Just staff, okay. Welcome back everyone. We just concluded our closed session. There's no reportable actions. So we'll adjourn this meeting. The next regular city council meeting will be Tuesday, February 8th at 5 p.m. for closed session, followed by open session at 6 p.m. Thank you and good night. Good night.